Welcome, everybody. Um, we have a very important task that's going to help all of you do the best possible job on writing your papers. And that's uh, why if let me go to the full screen view, because what's behind me, I've got my laptop camera face the opposite direction toward the, the uh, wall uh, behind me of my uh, bedroom here in Berkeley. And the reason is, if you can see that there, the nine elements of composition, which you all have been sent, that handout you need to have it out in front of you. You don't have to write more information than what is already printed. The definitions are on there, but not of all of the uh, techniques for space because they're so complex. That's the last element of the nine we're going to go over. So that will be the first portion of tonight's class. Please, at any point, speak up if you have questions because, of course, that's why we're doing this so that it's clear by the end, I hope, of this evening how you can identify, you know, see, identify, and describe correctly the nine elements in the works of art you're going to write your papers about. <clears throat> and of course, you have three more weeks, but I wouldn't wait till the week before it's due to pick a topic. You should start thinking about it between now and the next class. I find that people who usually do well on their papers. Most of them have picked, uh, here we go, welcome, we're just getting started. Most of them have picked their uh, topic for their paper and started the research about two weeks before it's due. Because you also have the option of sending me a draft, a semi-final draft, but not the night before it's due, or even less than 48 hours. But if you give me at least two days before the due date, I should be able to get back to you with feedback as to whether you're missing anything or not. Uh, and that's an option. You don't have to do that, of course, but it, it gives you more time if you have the paper almost done before the night, before the deadline, but just a word to the wise. Okay, so let's see. Um, do we have anybody else to admit? We'll probably get a few more coming, I assume. All right, if you look behind me, you'll see my, my father was a commercial artist. He was quite talented. Uh, when it comes to drawing, I didn't get those genes. <laughs> I got the gift of gab, the Irish heritage that my dad used to talk about, and writing skills. But drawing, he called this kind of artwork mouse, Mickey Mouse artwork. I like that phrase. Nothing to do with the Disney cartoons or anything. It's just that the drawings are a little bit cartoonish, but they'll work. I guarantee you, you'll be able to understand, uh, you know, if you're following and asking questions, if there's anything that's not clear as we go, you know, at the point where we're on a particular element, if it's not before we move on, I will stop and say any questions about this particular item. So by the end of this presentation, uh, you should have a much more solid idea. Of course, you should also be reading uh, Gill's, not Stuxnet, Gill's The Critic Sees, because she has a whole chapter with lots of more, you know, high quality illustrations of the examples of each of these elements. In, uh, in her book, The Critic Sees. Okay, so uh, let's see. Do we have anybody else to admit? We'll probably get a couple more as we go. I'm going to do some standing and some, some of it seated. And the goal is this, that without rushing, we get through all of this possibly in under an hour, but there, there's a lot to give you, and I, I won't rush. And any questions that come up at the point where they're relevant, I will answer. But we should be able to get started on ancient Near Eastern art. That's an important topic, Babylonian art, because you can see there are eight must-know slides, and we don't want to have to cram those all in the last hour and rush through that. Mm. We should get started. We should be able to get the first couple of must-know slides and then take a normal break and still maybe end a little bit early tonight, depending, again, on how many questions you have before the slides with these elements as we do them together uh, as well as any questions, how many you have, I mean, on, on, on the uh, slides. Okay, so have your, you should all have your uh, handouts in front of you. I'm going to hold them up as we go over each item and point to, I wrote the definitions out for the first, I think it's seven or eight of the nine definitions. Well, actually, yeah, the first eight. Okay, so the first one, we've covered some of these with the first two weeks lectures, but not consistently in a, in a you know, organized, detailed way. So I will give you the definitions. You can see that they're actually on printed out for the first eight or so of each of these. And then describe either verbally, because some of these don't bear or need to have a drawing to illustrate how these elements 
can be recognized. And some do, and when we do, you will see the, that's when I'll stand up and point to the, with, I have a pointer, <laughs> and I'm gonna make some changes as we go along. So, you, you know, as an illustration of, of how things can be, go from one, like balance, especially, you know, is it balanced or unbalanced? Is, uh, <clears throat> how, how to tell that in actual real time um, as, you, as you look at a work of art. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm going to do it in the order that um, is on the board, okay? Because I reserve the right to make slight alterations as we go. All right, so the first one you see, the board behind me is balanced. So how do you recognize if something's balanced? Well, you ask yourself, are there equal or roughly equal areas of objects from the top to the bottom and from the left to the right in a work of art. So now I need to stand up and illustrate how that works. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Very tight turnaround space here. All right, I think everybody can see, so I'm gonna keep my own actual, get a little bit closer there. <clears throat> Can't get too much closer or you, you know, won't be a place to sit in that way and there won't be uh, room for me to maneuver my drawing arm. Okay, so. With this point here, we're going to start with balance and how you determine if something is or is not balanced top to bottom or left to right. I covered this a little bit already, but you might want to write this, but you, you, you can just follow here and remember when you're writing your papers, you should use the same process as well as on the exam essay questions. You draw a grid around, or you can say border box, if you prefer the word box, around the uh, outer uh, area of that work of art. Of course, you don't really draw it literally unless you've got a print out of it at home and you want to mark up that, you know, uh, that, that printing of it. it. You do it in your mind, of course, uh, an imaginary box or grid pattern around the outer edge of any work of art, visual art, of course, we're talking about. That applies to paintings, sculpture, drawings, photos, or architecture. But if it's a painting, it's already there. That's called the frame. The frame of a painting is that outer border. But then you need to divide or subdivide that into four equal quadrants. That's as close as I could get to being equal. It's, it's reasonably obvious that what we're looking at is four different areas, top to bottom, right above the middle line and below, and left to right, of course, of a middle line right uh, in the center. So how do you judge if this is balanced? Well, as I said, with the definition that's on the handouts you should be looking at, you ask yourself, are there equal objects or areas of objects left to right or top to bottom? Let's see, is there someone else waiting? Yeah, there is Daisy, she, hang on, apparently. <laughs> okay, so we're just doing the first one, balance. All right, so would you say this is balanced? Let's look at it from uh, left to right. Are there equal, let's call these jellyfish. Let's, let's say this is a painting of jellyfish, for that, or you could say comets if you prefer. Uh, and these, <laughs> the number and placement of the objects is what you're looking for. So let's just do it this way. If this were the, you know, the first part of your paper and you're writing about balance, you can write about these elements in any order you want. But if I were you, I'd use this handout I just, uh, you know, referred to the one that you should be looking at as a checklist to make sure you don't overlook or miss any of these nine elements before you turn your paper in. Okay, so let's take a quick look. This is divided into two halves, left and right. Is it balanced left to right? Now, the way I drew this at this point? Anybody? <laughs> no, it's not balanced. Oh, hmm, interesting. I'm talking about left to right and we'll do the top to bottom. And that, um, Again, this is part of the process, so I'm not saying it's, but what would make uh, anyone think that it isn't balanced if you actually add up how many objects there are on the left and right sides, how many there are total, and they're the same overall area or shape, they don't have to be exact, remember it's a rough or, or total balance you're looking for. So taking another look at it, and seeing how many objects there are, let's call these jellyfish, on the left, right? And then on the right. Now, would you say it's roughly balanced? Anybody? Yeah, yeah it yeah. is. Because there's two objects 
on, on both halves, left and right. And even if the, the ones on the bottom are, look slightly larger, and I understand that's probably what the first person is thinking, so I don't think that's a wrong answer. If that's how you saw it and you said that, you'd get credit. I'm trying to make sure you all know I don't have some pedantic need to have you guys agree with everything that I see or think. That, that to me is not teaching, that's dictating. So if you were looking at this, I, I don't know who it was, but I don't want to call anybody's name out unless they choose to identify themselves to everyone else. It isn't wrong to say, well, to you, if you wrote it this way, the objects, the two objects at the bottom looks somewhat larger, so it seems slightly, but you wouldn't say, you know, in a, any major way that it's unbalanced. But when you look at the number of objects, uh, you, would, you would have to say it is roughly balanced uh, if you're looking at it that way. That's the easiest way to analyze if something's balanced. And how about top to bottom? Upper and lower half at this point in time notwithstanding the slight difference in the size of these, whatever they are, the head of these creatures, is it roughly balanced top to bottom? How many objects, in other words, are there above and below? Okay, I guess I'm feeling like that character in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? Remember, anyone, anyone? Okay. So when I said that I didn't feel this composition was balanced, I only said that because of the way that the four elements were arranged within the composition. Although there are equal number in each of the four quadrant, quadrants, I still felt that it was not balanced because mm -hmm. the negative space between all four objects, that's not a centralized composition. And so that I don't see that as being a balanced composition, even though there's the same number of objects right. in each section of the painting. Mm -hmm. I see balance as there being the same amount of negative space in each section. So I'm like, I'm not only am I looking at the objects within each space that I'm identifying within the larger piece, I'm also looking at their relationship to one another and how they're arranged within each quadrant. So that's how I'm analyzing it and seeing okay. whether or There's, not it's there balanced. There is no doubt that that's a valid possible interpretation and it would get you full credit if you explained it in you know a couple of sentences you should, is all you need. I recommend everyone should always have at least two sentences to explain how and why they feel or where they see certain objects and, and how they interpret them. Um, because of the way you described it, uh, you know, any reader that I know who's experienced who might be grading your paper or me, certainly, and I alternate, by the way, I always grade at least one of the two papers each person writes if the reader grades the other and vice versa, the same thing with the, with the uh, test. But anyway, the point is you, you get credit if you explained it that way. But in a broader general way, we call it rough balance. That's an actual phrase, right? Approximate or rough balance, you, you could make the case that it is balanced in terms of the number of objects. <laughs> but, but that's not all right or wrong. So your comment would accept it because you explained it clearly. Okay, so let's just now do this now with the number, uh, since uh, we have now you know a, a valid point of how you could have an alternative way of looking at the uh, balance issue. But let's just talk about the number of objects. OK, so let's try this. Let's see. What have we got going here? So that this will be what it should be. Yeah, there we go. I haven't used this in a six months, but sometimes the ink dries up. No, it's working. Uh, and then let's see. I'm trying to keep the number. See, so you, so you can make the case that these have three and these have four. So I'm going to give this four, <laughs> of course, naturally. <sighs> Regular magic marker is just too, too blunt an instrument, I know from experience. So trying to use this. There we go. That might make some difference in the point that you raised earlier, just a few minutes ago. OK, so if this has four, <laughs> sorry that the some of these lines are, are fainter than others, but that's just the way the uh, marker is doing. Okay. We don't get too detailed. Now, <clears throat> is it balanced top, roughly balanced in terms of the number of objects, top to bottom? 
Anyone? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Because of there being three objects, but left to right, you get the idea. We need to kind of pick up the pace here. It definitely would not be balanced left to right, no matter how you want to interpret the placement or the number of objects. So obviously you can see how altering, you know, uh, the specific placement of, of, of these individual objects in any work of art, any of the objects being depicted on a painting, a drawing, uh, uh, or of course a, a, a photograph uh, could, could cause it to be considered balanced, roughly balanced left to right or top to bottom. I would recommend since it's, unless you've been writing about these things, sounds like a couple of you have before you took this class, uh, you might just want to think of it as the actual number of similar shaped objects on each of the quadrants as an easier sort of more straightforward way to determine if it looks quote again roughly or approximately balanced. Okay, to get it back to balance, I think we can wrap this up pretty quickly, you would need to then go back to <clears throat> having right the same number of objects. And that's what I'm doing now right. Now, hopefully these are a little larger when, since before we had that conversation just now with one of your fellow students that might make it look a little bit. Now, these are slightly higher than the bottom of the border that, than these are to the top. So I see the point you were raising. I wouldn't, again, it's up to you to explain it, but if you do, you get flexibility in terms of the credit. But if someone just said it doesn't look balanced at all and didn't explain that, they would just get partial credit. But now you'd have to say it's roughly balanced. Okay, you get main ideas here. We're not trying to, you know, everybody by the, tonight, the end of tonight's lecture is going to understand all nine elements perfectly and not ever have any questions about them. Of course, uh, obviously, that's why, you know, besides regular every class, as you know, at the end of each evening, I stick around for questions or as they come up during the slides, but also by email. All right, stable versus dynamic. I don't think we have to spend much time on that because I've already covered that in several different examples on the first two weeks of lectures, but I'll go ahead and restate the definition. A dynamic versus stable is when you look for the presence of two or more, I'm gonna sit down now, two or more diagonal and or, it could be either or both. Two or more diagonal and or curved lines make something dynamic. Whereas the use of straight lines right, or right angles make something stable. So most works of art have, have elements of both, of course. It, it just goes, you know, like the actual real world scene or, or imaginary, he say, scene would have, of course, with, um, you know, group portrait of, you know, crowd or some kind of event that's being painted or, or drawn by an artist. Uh, or a photo, of course, of, of a city street or of a building or a house. Most of the time, you'll see some parts of a work of art that are stable and some are dynamic. I think it's pretty straightforward as to how to tell the difference. So are there any questions on this? The second element, um, actually here we have it as the first on your list, but on the board, it's number two. Anybody have any questions about that? All right, rhythm. That, of course, we covered briefly, but not in much detail. I think it was last week. Rhythm in visual art as opposed to music, two different kinds of rhythm. Of course, uh, rhythm in this class is when you look for the presence of two or more repeated or similar shapes. So you kind of see how that similar is a matter. It is a matter of somewhat susceptible to personal judgment, but I'm going to give you some examples that are pretty concrete and that you can almost always be safe if you use these examples of analysis about rhythm in a painting or drawing that if you choose to write about one, that is, let's start with a human a portrait, someone's head and neck, right? We're going to see with Nefertiti, the bust of Nefertiti. It, believe me, if you ever get to see that, you have to go to Berlin, Germany, of all places to see it was stolen by the Germans, of course, before World War I. So it's in a museum in Berlin. You stand in front of that, it'll send shivers down your spine. If once you, you know what you're looking at. It's an amazing life mask image while she was still in power as one of the few female rulers of Egypt. We'll get to, get to that next week. So she's missing one eye now, though. Ooh. It's not a good example because if you know what I'm talking about, some of you, you've seen that image of her, and it's in your textbook, of course, uh, because those idiots that stole it dropped, dropped the plaster life-size 
uh, uh, cast of her face and one eyeball came out. So she's got one eye that's blank, but the eye sockets and the course, the eyebrows, the two ears, one of them was, was slightly damaged too, the two lips. I mean, there's, there's always good, in other words, bottom line, there's always gonna be rhythm in a portrait of an intact human face or head, we'll say, always. I mean, sometimes people are missing an eye and they have a patch over it, okay, fine, but that's not typical, what you, typically what you're gonna write about, but you could still say, even if there's only one eye, okay, there's not a rhythm in that part of this person's face, but there's two nostrils, two lips, two ears. You get the idea. Uh, any portrait of a human head and, and or human beings, normal intact face or head will have rhythm by definition. So will a full body portrait. Oh, sorry, let's get this person in. Yeah, we're just on uh, the third element of uh, composition. If you have your, you should have your list. We covered the first two, this will be on, uh, uh, by the way, I didn't post as early as I normally do because I thought my foot was infected, it looked like it was. So I was kind of focused on taking care of that. It turned out it wasn't, but I didn't, Friday wasn't a day I could, you know, get to the computer even. So that's why it was Sunday evening or morning, I think when I sent you guys, uh, if you notice that I posted, not sent you, posted, I meant on, on YouTube, the, all the lectures from last week's classes. So you, if you didn't know that, you can go see those if you missed part of those. And the same with this, this will be posted, but by Friday, this coming Friday by eight. Okay, so if you miss the first couple people joining late, then you can catch that uh, by the end of this week. So rhythm is always present in a group portrait or a full body portrait. Again, a full body intact human body is gonna have two arms, two hands, two legs, two feet. And of course, group portraits are gonna have, now people would say, and I wouldn't argue with this, well, what if it's a group of people that are of all different ages and sizes and different heights, but they still have same similar shaped body parts. So I would still uh, err towards the side of conservative interpretation and just say, a crowd scene is going to have rhythm because the human bodies all have certain basic, if they're intact, of course, um, parts that are roughly the same shape, heads, hands, arms, and legs. So a group portrait uh, or crowd scene, an individual full length portrait of a person, or uh, just, you know, a, a painting of someone's or drawing or photo of someone's head and, and shoulders. That's called a bust if it's a piece of sculpture. Uh, that's going to have rhythm. And by the way, sculpture even if it's just a single human body or a bus like the one of Nefertiti, by definition has certain overall repeated shapes. And so rhythm is very powerful in, in the use of uh, any images of human uh, bodies, uh, whether singular or in a group. And then we have the other uh, aspect of, the, of a common source of easy without having to analyze too deeply a landscape. I don't know a single landscape that doesn't have rhythm. Uh, and that would mean, of course, if there's, you know, plants, trees, usually in a the landscape, there's at least some kind of plant life, trees or bushes, mountains in the distance. If it's a, a scene of a town, right, like a mountain side town or something, then there's going to be repeated roughly similar shapes of the houses or maybe more than one church steeple. You get the idea. So most landscapes and or cityscapes, if you want to divide them into two subcategories, uh, scenes like that are going to, by definition, have rhythm. But I think it's pretty clear when you see roughly the same, don't have to be exactly, but using your judgment, similar, very similar or same shapes, two or more of them, you know that that at least part of that work of art has rhythm. And that, that applies to buildings too, because buildings, let me think about it. I, 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 there were a couple of buildings built in the 70s with no windows at college campuses. Alameda College had a, a prison architect designed it. I know I, I, I had a girlfriend I used to pick up after school there and the child care center had, I think, a few windows, but some of the classrooms had no windows. So, okay, maybe that's just a concrete box and there's no rhythm, but most buildings have repeated shapes, of course, you know, more than one door or entrance and lots of windows by definition. So rhythm exists and can exist and almost always does in any any type of visual art, building, the archi you know, architecture, sculpture, painting, drawing, or photos, if you see two or more similar shapes. Okay, that should be pretty straightforward. Any questions about number three? All right, line. I'll now also use my pointer again. <clears throat> I think I can just remain seated for this. Number four on the board, the way we're doing it in this order. 
Line, there's several ways to use line. There are three main things that line can be used as. One is as outlines, right? And the two main types of outlines are bold or thin lines around, of course, the outer edge of a person, you know, a body or an object. I think we already covered that Michelangelo, I believe, was yeah, the first night of class in the introductory uh, uh, lecture, that he used bold outlines around all his human and, and divine figures, you know, any creatures or figures from heaven or, or on earth that he painted, uh, their bodies had bold outlines. That was his technique. But with most works of art, you're going to see some of both, depending on, you know, what the artist wants you to emphasize. Bold outlines usually make you notice that object more than the ones with thin. And some paintings, many, in fact, the majority probably uh, almost, no, yeah, easily over half would have just only thin outlines where you hardly see the outline at all. You can use your judgment. I said at the start of tonight that I'm not pedantic, if you know what that word means, as long as you explain yourself and give an example of where you see or why you think there's only thin outlines or bold. Obviously, though, if you were writing about a Michelangelo painting and you said all the lines are thin, you, you would get points off because it's clear that he used bold outlines. Uh, They're very distinct in his work. So just take a moment to look and see, are there outlines that are visible at all? And if so, are they thin or bold? Okay, then the next category or technique, I mean, that line can be used for is shading. The other phrase for that is cross hatching, where, where the artist, and I already did it because I don't want to stand up here and shake this. This is a very precariously perched whiteboard here, just in the small space, very minimal space that it fits here. So if I draw on it too much, it'll fall. Okay, so what have we got? Shading with cross hatching, where the lines overlap each other. And, and when they get enough of them together, that could be for a, a drawing or a painting. It could be in a color or black and white work of art. Then you, you've got shading created with line. So that's a, a second technique, uh, uh, or sorry, use of the line technique. The third one is in sculpture, carved lines. Of course, with, uh, let's take Michelangelo's David. Everyone knows what that is, that huge statue of Michelangelo's uh, version of the shepherd boy from the Bible, David, after yes. he, right, or, or is about to fight Goliath. His view is, is before the battle. And that 16 and a half foot tall piece of marble, I'm going to bring it up again when we get to textures. But with line, you wouldn't know, you know who it was, let alone be able to see how beautifully realistic every detail is if it weren't for the lines. And how are the lines done? Of course, they're not painted, they're carved. With sculpture, lines are always carved. Uh, some sculpture has painted lines over the material that did happen. And we'll see that with the Nefertiti, for instance, the bust of Nefertiti. Both carved and, and painted lines could be in sculpture, but most sculpture, certainly the kind we're gonna see from the ancient world, the vast majority of them, uh, or just one solid color, whatever that is on the, you know, stone itself, whatever the color of the original stone was. And then all the, the lines are carved into this stone. You know. Okay, and then there's buildings. Buildings don't have drawn or carved, well, they can have carved line. Some of the older like courthouses and prisons and things would have the name of the building carved above the entrance into the facade, right? So you see it when you go inside. But that's not likely to be something you're going to write about. So most modern buildings, and even ancient ones like temples and things, they, they did not have very much of any carved line. A little bit, some of them. The Romans did more of that than anyone else. So you look and see if there's no carved line, well then is there a line in a building? Yes and no. It's called visual line. That's the edges of the building as they appear to form a line when the sun shines on a corner. Obviously, the sun can't go around the corner, <laughs> the sun rays. So it creates shadows, right? On one side of a corner and the other side is bright. That, that creates an effect. So in architecture, most lines are visual lines at the edges or corners of a building. And then occasionally there is carved or painted line. Okay, so now we're through four of these. Any questions about line? All right, masses. This is the one more people miss than anything else, but it's one of the easiest to, to analyze because of the way uh, that Dr. Gill, and that is her title, she, she had a PhD, right? So has a PhD. So I, I don't call her that, I call her Sarah because she's a friend, but Sarah Gill or Dr. Gill's book explains very carefully uh, that masses 
the other term for that is volume, but we prefer to keep the, the, the terms, the names of these techniques consistent so it doesn't get confusing. So you should say in your paper, for mass, what are you looking for? With this the larger mass. Yeah, the largest objects or parts of a work of art. But all we ask you to do to get, I don't want you to go too you know, detailed, is identify the three largest masses or parts, you could say, in any work of art. So now I'm gonna do another one of my, in this case, I'm going from Mickey Mouse to King Kong art, okay? As corny as that may sound, most of you have seen, right? Or many of you have at least one version of King Kong. And if you haven't seen the original 1933 black and white one, you missed the best version. I like the Jack Black version from the early aughts. It's pretty good. And the one in the seventies, yeah, whatever. And then there's a new one, isn't it recently? Yeah, King Kong, he's coming back every generation. <laughs> but in all those three first three versions, he dies, right? While he's on top of the Empire State. Well, actually in the seventies, it's the Twin Towers, but of course that can't happen anymore. So the point is that there is a uh, structure, the Empire State Building, which in the first three, for well, at least several uh, versions of the King Kong story, has a three section mass. So what I'm saying about that is, let's take a look at here at this rather, again, mediocre illustration, but I think you get the point across. The Empire State Building has three sections to it. The building itself has a base, a shaft, and then the spire, mostly we call it spire, though it's really kind of a continuation of the of, above the roof of the building where it gets narrow. So if you're looking at, at a photo that you're, let's say you're writing about a building that's designed like that, you know, anything with, with more than one shape to it, it's pretty straightforward to ask yourself, well, what section of that building is the largest, therefore the largest mass? It would be the shaft. It's 80 stories tall. The Empire State Building is 102 stories, by the way. So 80 story tall shaft, clearly that's the largest mass in that building. And if you look at a photo of it, you can tell that at a glance. The second largest mass is the base, which is about um, uh, 20 stories high, pretty, pretty good chunk of uh, concrete right there. So that's the second largest mass. And then the third largest mass is what they call the spire, uh, which is really two stories at the top for observation. And then the spire that poor King Kong was shot down off of, if you know <laughs> any of that, the ending of those movies about him. So what I'm saying is that a building has a variety of masses and it might not be obvious at first glance if you look at, you know, hey, it's one structure. So you, you, you would get some credit if you just gloss over and say, what well, is a single building? So there's only one mass. Buildings have different sections or parts that are different sizes. So we should be able to identify the three largest parts of the building. Okay, any questions about number five? Um, oh, Sam, did you have a, oh, okay. It's a thumb, thumbs up. Oh, okay. <laughs> you mean the corny drawing or comments, right? <clears throat> All right, let's now, we're going to get to the more, as we go, they get more complex. Textures. This one takes a little more analysis to get, you know, into the, the details. Textures can be two main categories or subcategories, simulated or real. Simulated textures is when an artist uses paint. In fact, again, I have to reach over here because this table, I have my computer perched on, is not big enough to put my papers on. Okay, so when it comes to techniques, the, that might mean the artist um, would use um, shading, line, and color to create the illusion of real textures in that two-dimensional work of art. Uh, we are talking about a painting or drawing first. Let's start with just that. So obviously a painting is, has got simulated textures unless it's an abstract. And of course you can write about an abstract painting if you want, there's no limit to the time frame or style of art you have to write about for the two papers in this class. But most of you are gonna write about works of art that have a realistic style to them. So we'll, we'll take Henry VIII. It's one of my favorite villains. I mean, I don't like the guy, the guy was a monster, but he's definitely a colorful character that almost everybody's seen, maybe, well, many of you anyway, one or two of the paintings. He had dozens of paintings. He had an ego as big as all outdoors, and he was probably the most uh, despicable ruler of the 16th century. And that's saying a lot that it's when they used to burn people at the stake, right? So uh, he had, what, five of his six wives either imprisoned or, or executed. Um, you know the story, some of you had six wives all together. So uh, at some point you may have seen, if you have, you, it should be familiar to you, uh, a painting 
of him, one of his you know, dozens that were done during his 40 years as king of England. Um, and those would have, of course, simulated texture all the way around because he always wore fancy, expensive clothing, you know, uh, gilded and or, you know, gold threads in his, uh, you know, uh, silk, whatever, robe or not robe, I should say jacket, they call them. And then, you know, his beard and his face, there's simulated texture and others on the skin, on the hair, the beard, the clothing. And you see he had either a crown or a fancy cap that indicated he was the king. So you'd see lots of simulated texture. You only have to give me at least, again, for an A, two examples of where you see them. But if the, the textures are simulated in a painting or drawing, they're going to be simulated. You have to describe to get full credit. Are they sharp? You could say or strong. Either word would do. They're synonymous. Uh, which it would be in a Renaissance painting. And of course, Henry VIII lived in the Renaissance. So the paintings of him and all the other famous people that were painted, or even common people were painted in sharp, realistic style. So the cinematic textures on a Renaissance painting uh, are going to be sharp. But what about if they're not? If they're soft or diffuse, don't forget that's a D-I, not D-E. That's a different word. Diffuse textures or soft textures are common in something like an X, sorry, Impressionist painting. Oh, and also X with an E, Expressionist, the next generation after the Impressionist. So, so when you move towards more modern era paintings, you're going to notice the textures aren't always sharp and realistic. So if that's the case, you'd say that and give me two examples of where you see soft or diffused simulated textures in that painting or, or drawing. Usually drawings, it's not as easy to do that because you're usually using ink or, or you're engraving into a piece of metal right, to create an engraving. Uh, but you could have some, you know, soft uh, simulated textures. Uh, some artists can do that with drawings. But with a painting, it's easy to do either one or both. Well, some paintings have part of the painting is sharp and realistic, and other parts are soft and diffused. Okay, so that's simulated textures. What about sculpture, though? With a sculpture, the simulated textures are created. Let's do the David again uh, example. I mean, of, of David, the statue by Michelangelo, that's 16 and a half feet tall, made out of marble. What are there real textures there or simulated textures or both? Real textures. Real of the marble, yeah. Are there also simulated textures on his face, his hands, his feet? You've seen it. I don't know. <laughs> well, how would you know that it was a person and uh, what he looked like if there weren't? Oh, okay. Both. That's all I'm saying. It's both. So no, this is the first time most of you have ever done these things. So uh, there's no right or wrong here. That's I was confused. I thought it was only for the material. <laughs> yeah, well, it's both. No, you were right. Is, is it correct to say there's a real texture in sculpture is the material the artist used? Exactly. And then you'd say the real textures here are smooth marble. But they're simulated textures, uh, you know, in that portrait, David, of, uh, you know, hair, skin, fingernails, toenails, right? And those are created by carved line, by the way, which I did mention a couple of elements back. Remember, I said we'd revisit that concept. So carved line is what you usually use in sculpture to create simulated texture. But don't forget that all sculpture has the real texture of the material. You can tell by looking closely if it's carved out of wood or metal or stone, and whether then you need to say, was it the smooth or rough? You don't have to get too detailed because textures are usually one or the other, real textures. Now, what about buildings? Buildings, it's real texture almost always, because uh, buildings are the material that, at least certainly in all the last 150 years or 130 years, at least since uh, the turn of the 1890s till today, most buildings don't simulate phony textures. They can. Victorian houses did. Maybe some of you rented or lived in one or have friends who did, and you walked up to a mantelpiece and thought it was, you know, gold, a wooden mantelpiece or a marble, and you see it was just painted that way. That that would be a cement texture in a building, but that's not likely to be what you're writing about. So with architecture, you would need to describe the actual material in as real textures, and then say, is it smooth or rough? So any building, let's say, made out of concrete, metal, and glass you would say there are uh, three real textures here, smooth glass on the windows, smooth metal on the framing, say, or even the exterior of the building. And then maybe the entryway is rough, real concrete, the real texture of uh, rough concrete. Concrete can be either rough or smooth, obviously. So you just have to look and see which, which it appears to be, smooth 
or rough. So again, with building, you're mostly going to be writing about real textures. There are some cases with cement textures. Uh, it mostly we're talking about Victorian home interiors, but that's not likely to be what you'll be writing about. Okay, so textures can be described again as uh, diffused if it's in a painting or a drawing or soft or diffused or sharp and realistic. Uh, or of course, uh, in a building, they are usually real and with sculpture, it's both. Okay, so any questions now? Let's take a brief pause. We've got- I do have one for that. Go ahead. I had one. So regarding textures for like paintings, yes. would it, it would, so would it basically be like simulated because you'd just be seeing like the different shapes and things in that, like if it's a landscape and it has trees or waves or something, where, well, how would you describe for textures yeah, for that? Sure. That's a good question. <clears throat> you can say the artist here creates the uh, simulated textures of the water, is it right? As in the waves on the sea or, or a lake, right? Uh, uh -huh. and, uh, they are sharp and realistic. He also used, or she also used similar textures on the uh, trees, which uh, have a rough bark and maybe smooth leaves. There you go. See, that's okay. a, two examples of, of uh, similar textures that look realistic. Uh, and uh, yet, if you could tell the difference between smooth and, you know, water, pretty by definition, you'd probably say water is always a smooth texture, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and trees or plants can be either, of course, as as can buildings. So you get the idea. Okay. Yeah. No, it's, it's yeah. A, okay. A good question. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Sure. Of course. Uh, let's see. Now we're going to go on to modeling. <laughs> and for this, I'm going to stand up again. <clears throat> and again, we're talking about the technique, not the career. Okay. This is the closest I've come to an actual circle. <laughs> it's not easy for me to draw standing up with a board that moves like this. I probably put it lying down on my bed when I did this. This is over two years ago I did these, when we first started Zoom. So I'm not going to redraw this. Uh, it's as good as it'll get. Modeling, what does that mean in terms of, well, well, down on your list, it's number nine, but we're going in the order that the board has listed. Modeling is the use of contrasting areas of light and dark, right, um, to create the illusion of a three-dimensional object. So with this one, I think you can see I drew the arrow, this, this rather prominent arrow, in the, to indicate the direction from which the light is coming. Let's just say this is a giant uh, ball of stone, which may sound bizarre, but there are such things all over Renaissance Italian gardens in Italy that they start, because they finally figured out the world was round. <laughs> Seriously, and they started putting giant balls of stone at the top of staircase, manual posts, right? and entrances to, to palaces and uh, in gardens. So let's say you have this kind of a Renaissance painting and one of the objects is you know, being painted realistically in that painting you're writing about is a giant ball of stone. Well then how you describe the modeling is th there is strong realistic, especially if it's a Renaissance, it's gonna be sharp and realistic modeling. Uh, and you can see it on this giant stone ball where the light comes from the lower right, the lower right. And the shadow is on the other half. So then you've identified an example of realistic modeling. Okay, but what about soft modeling? Well, that's always the case. Well, almost always the case with uh, impressionist paintings and any paintings after that in the early 20th century, uh, where the artist wasn't trying to be super realistic. They were rejecting that idea of Renaissance realism. So they would have, again, soft or diffused. Those two words are pretty much synonymous. Sharp or strong, I didn't write that in here, but sharp or strong are synonymous to describe realistic simulated texture. With modeling, it's going to be, again, if there is any modeling, either sharp or you could say realistic, like this drawing, or it could be soft, and I don't know what drawing that here, soft or diffused, like uh, in an impressionist uh, landscape, right, or, or garden scene or something. I think that's pretty straightforward, right? Any questions about number seven? All right, colors. I have to reach all the way over here and let's do that. Now this, this we started to talk about, but I don't think I, I had this, uh, the, the specific listings uh, that I do here now, which you have in front of you as a number eight. Okay, color, um, which is the use of warm colors or earth tones, all right? And here we have warm or earth tones. I've listed the main ones in parentheses. Red, yellow, orange, gold, 
brown and pink or any combination of those shades. Now think about this. I've had people say, though not recently for a couple semesters, but a few times when I did this lecture on Zoom, well, earth tones that includes grass and trees, right? And, and, and you just listed that green is a cool color, the opposite of warm colors. There are four main cool colors, blue, green, gray, and white. Well, no, because plants and, and grass are not in the earth, they are on top of it or above it. We're talking about objects that come from the earth itself. Anybody who's done painting or knows where paints come from, my mother was a very prolific painter. She had a couple of them, one woman shows actually when we were kids in Chicago and then again when we moved to LA. Um, kind of neat, you know, see your mom's paintings in the front page of a newspaper or something. Never sold about more than five of them in their whole life. But anyway, the point is that, that we, she's talking about the, where the paints come from and why we shouldn't, you know, when we were little kids, don't, don't suck on the paint tubes because they have these chemicals in them that came from the earth, you know, and the colors were named for that, like burnt sienna and umber and all that kind of thing. So the point is, we mean things from inside the earth that come from within the, the dirt and below our feet. That's what we mean by earth tones. Okay, so earth tones, I've listed them now. Why would an artist use warm tones or earth tones? And we just say warm to keep it simple. It's because warm tones appear to advance in the viewer's eyesight and cool tones appear to recede or be farther away from uh, the viewer. So here, I'm gonna prove that point. Let's hope that with the lighting here, because in the afternoon, the light was reflecting off of this from the uh, behind the curtains, but that isn't an issue now. Oh, good, this, well, nope, there it is. <laughs> so temporarily, I'm gonna put this down, even though the lighting will make me look like Dracula in the original black and white movie version. <laughs> it's still got a little problem there. So let's just do it, that. that'll work. Can you see this is the cover of a magazine, which is still around, by the way. I think so, at least the last time I checked. But this was from the uh, pandemic. It's 1919, the height of the last pandemic in the previous century, you know, the one that killed uh, 75 million people worldwide, much worse than the one we're dealing with, bad as this is. Okay, so what do we see? We see a house that the artist wants us to notice first. So that painter used, and is a painting, red, yellow and brown, yellow on the walls, red on the roof, and brown on the wood trim around the doors and windows. Those are all earth tones. They're all warm colors, and we therefore notice them first. That's the whole idea why an artist would use a mixture of warm and cool tones. So then what is the opposite? Well, of course, everything around the house are cool tones. The blue with a little bit of white in the sky and the different shades of green on the grass and trees and white on the picket fence Clearly, you don't notice them as quickly. It's an unconscious, uh, not even, it's not even open to debate. Subconsciously, uh, people with, and that's with normal full color vision, of course, uh, as a given. But if you have normal color vision, your brain notices subconsciously at first, the warm colors always before the cool colors. That's why they're often used together in a painting so that the artist is emphasizing or trying to get your eyes to pick up on the warm colored objects first. Okay, I think you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> hopefully that clarifies it uh, somewhat. So you're gonna see both in a lot of works of art, but one thing that, uh, this is an important detail. Let me put this back here so I don't look like Bela Lugosi in the 1933 Dracula. <clears throat> without the cape, of course. Okay, so what we had with this is there's one other category, and uh, this is an easy one to overlook uh, or get confused about. So let me make sure it's clear before we get to the most complex of all the categories space. Okay, so uh, what happens though if there's no contrast of warm and cool colors, if it's just black and white together, it, like on this board I just drew, or any engraving? from the, you know, any, all the way back to the Middle Ages, there were engravings that far back, Renaissance, or even today, a lot of people do engraving. Uh, I think they teach it, don't they, at the JC, I'm pretty sure. Um, printmaking, it may be called. Well, that could, could be a color, but if the uh, medium that is chosen for the work of art you're writing about is black and white, contrasting uh, lines of black with a white background or vice versa, then that's neither, cool nor warm. When there's no warm color to contrast, that's considered neutral. So the uses of black and white together or black, white, and shades of gray are considered all neutral colors. If there's no warm color contrasting with them, 
like I did show you on that uh, cover of the magazine, where you have warm and cool colors side by side, it, it should be pretty easy to tell which is warm, which is cool. Uh, and all human skin tones are considered warm by definition. Okay, so black by itself is always neutral too. It's not like you're going to write about a work of art that just a solid, well, what would you write about, right? <laughs> a solid black image with just paint, black paint or something or ink across the entire composition. That wouldn't be much for you. To, you wouldn't want to choose that to write about. So you're going to see black, of course, quite often in, in, in engravings uh, or some photographs, of course. Photographs that are black and white or movies, old movies. By the way, can you write about movie images for your papers? Yes, but you need to, it's called still. Some of you know this. You know, just a static image of a second or a moment in a scene from a movie that has then been converted into a photograph from that film. You know, that's what they usually use or often did on movie posters, you know, or of course, uh, <clears throat> What, uh, let's see, what am I thinking? Cells are called when it's a cartoon, like a Disney cartoon, you know, they, each one was drawn, not anymore. <laughs> they used to be hand drawn. Those are valuable if you find those at a, <clears throat> an auction somewhere or a yard sale. So if you have a single still image from a movie, a scene from a movie, you can you can write about it if you choose to. That's, an, you know, a topic for a paper in a class like this with visual art, because it's, is a single image you can analyze in detail like we're doing now. So if it's from a black and white movie, then it, by definition, the colors are neutral. You'd have to say that too, though. Remember that. Or if the work of art you write about is a, a black and white original, some paintings are black and white, or certainly engravings, as I just mentioned. You have to say that in your paper. You don't say, there are no warm or cool colors here and keep going, because I'll have no way of knowing, or the reader who's grading your paper, whether the original work was or was not in color. So you have to state that. Be clear and then you would add that fact that that makes it neutral okay we're down to the last element but any questions about uh this the second to last the colors all right you probably will have a question or two some of you will see on our last technique space the final technique here we go there are six elements uh, i mean sorry six tactics you can say or types of techniques that an artist can use when they're depicting space or depth, both words are you know interchangeable, but we just say for space when you're writing your papers to keep it simple. That's how your papers will be you know graded if you covered whether or not. So you listen carefully, whether or not all six elements were used. If you just ignore some that you don't see, you get a couple. You might still get an A, but why not try to get a hundred? Right, this is what most people will be uh, wanting to get: hundred points, hundred percent on on your papers. So with space, there are six techniques, and I'm going to now have to stand up for the last part of this and point to them and illustrate a couple examples or give you a couple. Let's start with the simplest technique of all ever, ever used by any artist in the history of the human race. Remember, we already saw this with the cave paintings. Overlapping. I think you guys know that. You recognize it when you see it, right? It's when there are two or more objects in a two-dimensional work of art, and one object overlaps the other one, and the object being overlapped is supposed to be farther away from the viewer. I think that pretty much explains itself, right? Okay, register line, I don't think we've talked about too much, if at all. We're going to see this tonight, not tonight, next week when we get to Egyptian art. Register line is when an artist draws two or more horizontal lines. Now, this, I didn't write all these definitions. It would have filled up another whole page. So if you want to, I'll say these slowly. If you do repeat them, let me know if you choose to write them in the margin or whenever or wherever, a separate piece of paper if you want to. But they're all defined in much more detail in separate chapters uh, within Sarah Gill's book. So with register line, you see an artist would draw this technique, they would draw two or more horizontal lines, visible, visible lines onto the composition. And those objects on the lower lines are supposed to be closest to the viewer and objects on the upper lines are meant to look further away from the viewer. It's a very simplistic method of depicting space, not very uh, you know, detailed or accurate, but ancient art used it quite a bit. Uh, even some cave paintings, I think, but it's definitely a Babylonian Egyptian artist did that. Again, I think that one, the second technique of space, depicting spaces should be pretty straightforward and self-explanatory, but stop at any point if you have questions as we go through the remaining ones. Diminishing size 
is when you show objects that uh, appear to be further away because the smaller they are, right? Diminishing in size, that's supposed to create the illusion of them being further away. So when you, you show a group of objects, uh, they don't have to be the same. It's just the best I could do those corny stick figures. Uh, the smallest ones are meant to look further away from the viewer and the larger ones are supposed to be closest to the viewer. Okay, so far. So good, any questions? All right, now we get to the more complex ones. Foreshortening. Okay, this one I know I didn't write the definition on the paper. It's not a long one, so you might want to write this. Okay, foreshortening is a technique for depicting depth or space in a work of art in which that part of an object, here we go, or that part of an object closest to the viewer appears wider and that part farthest away from the viewer appears narrower, period. That's what we saw with my slides of Stonehenge, wasn't that last week? Yeah, right. Where some of the stones had fallen down. And so whether it's a painting or a photo like mine were, a drawing, whatever, of something like that, where giant blocks of long, narrow pieces of stone, blocks, I guess, of stone have, you know, are on the ground, there's definitely going to be foreshortening there. Absolutely, because that's the only way you can tell what you're looking at. And those pieces of stone, remember, they were up to 22 feet long. They're going to fade in, you know, uh, the width of them will get narrower in our view. It's just that that's how human beings, human eyesight perceives objects in the distance, fading off in the distance. We're talking about within a single object now, obviously. So for shortening, you look at an object in a two-dimensional work of art and you see that part of it that looks like it's supposed to be further away is narrower and the part closest that's supposed to be closest to us is wider. If that's the case, you know, like the painting of, let's say, people standing uh, with their shoulders toward us. I mean, there are such paintings and you may even write about some. Oh, or, or an object like a, a vehicle, a car or a bus or something coming towards us. Well, that's definitely going to have foreshortening because the part closest if it's coming at us, the front of the car or the bus, the vehicle is going to be wider than the back because foreshortening is how we see things, real uh, optics in, in, in space, human eyesight perceives them that way. So foreshortening is just a way of capturing the uh, human uh, tendency to see optics look smaller the further away they are. But each individual object is what you're looking for. So everybody clear on that one, number four? Any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Question? Oh, okay. I sound like you might have had one. All right. Now we get to the two most complex techniques. And this one is one I can get everybody in all my classes has been able to do this for themselves. You don't have to do it at all to get in the, in the class. But if you've never done it, you might want to the next time you drive across Kotati grade in the daytime on Highway 101. It doesn't matter whether they're heading north or south. <laughs> I do it every week when I come up to teach that in-person class of the 25 years. So what is that? What technique is that? Atmospheric perspective. What? Atmospheric perspective. Okay, I'm pointing at the, de the term. I'm going to give you the definition now, and then if you have questions, uh, just, just go ahead and state them or raise your hand on the screen. Here we go. Here's that definition. I don't believe I know I didn't write it on the paper, so you're going to want to write it now, probably. No, I did. I did. What am I saying? It's right there. Atmospheric perspective. Yeah, I, I modify this every couple of semesters. Is uh, where those objects farthest away from the viewer, under number seven, you see that? Those objects farthest away from the viewer appear bluer and hazier than those objects closest to the viewer. Again, it's a technique for depicting space in a color work of art. That's what I should have added to that. It doesn't apply to black and white works of art or indoor or nighttime. So a daytime scene, any kind of daytime scene where the work of art is in color, atmospheric perspective could be used. It isn't always used, but that's if it is, then you're going to see the objects that are supposed to be farthest away from us, the viewer, will look bluer and hazier than those objects closest to the viewer. That's just reality. That's how uh, air is. I mean, some of you know, the atmosphere is full of particles, of course. <laughs> it's not just some empty space. You know, obviously there's all kinds of particles in, in the air. 
Uh, and so when we look further and further away from us towards let's do the Katati grade exercise. If next time you drive, you've never done this, take a look, but of course, be careful about the cars and the lanes on either side of you. Make sure it's safe when you do this. You know, take a quick glance during the daytime, of course, and not when it's raining, but on a clear day, look towards the west, towards the horizon. Uh, and you'll see this effect. It's always there. It depends on what time of day and how much haze there is. You know, if there's pollution, like, oh, we're after a fire, it's going to be even more pronounced. Uh, what? That changes the color into an orange color, but that's a, a false effect or an uncommon effect. So it's a natural uh, result of the way that air and particles in the air obscure optics further away from us. So that's where you see the upper half of the definition, atmospheric perspective. That means it's the way we really see objects further away from us because of all the particles in the air. And the farther away the object is, the more particles we, we, we see between us and that object. So again, it's when the object farthest away from us appear bluer and hazier than objects that are closest. Okay, now a question. I think I heard somebody. Go ahead. Uh, where do you say that um, 101, but where? A highway 101, Katati grade. Everybody knows where that is, right? You have to take Katati grade to get to down south, to get to Pet Petaluma even. Well, you could take oh, Katati grade. Yeah, Katati grade. I don't know what, what, there's no other word to call it, right? It's the only pass. It's not really a mountain pass. I call those hills. Between Petaluma, sorry, and Santa Rosa, whether you're going north or south, highway 101 goes over the Katati grade, right? Two words, of course. Yeah. And when you drive that part where you're at the high point of that pass, you look down towards, you know, the horizon towards the Pacific Ocean and out towards, you know, the far, far west towards the horizon, you'll see this effect. It's inevitable. If it's a sunny day, of course, the clear, not, it has to be totally clear, but, you know, not, not rainy and not during the fire season, okay, when it's normal daytime sunlight, you will see this effect. If you haven't ever done that, next time you drive, uh, you know, down from Santa, I don't know where some of you live north already going, I mean, from Petaluma, you're going to be driving north. But anytime you go down or along Highway 101 and you're at the Katadi grade, if you didn't do this, take a look, you'll see that effect. It's, it's uh, just the reality of how human beings who have normal color vision, of course, perceive uh, objects in the distance. By the way, the culture that developed it was probably the Romans. You don't have to know, but we're going to talk about that when we get to Roman art, because atmospheric perspective wasn't even known to the early ancient world. I don't even think it was used by the Greeks, maybe, maybe some of the, the later Greeks, but it becomes a very popular technique with Roman frescoes. You'll see what I mean. And then it got lost. You don't have to know this part. In the Middle Ages, you know, everything went to hell. Pardon my French. I mean, in Europe, I'm talking about Whereas in the Muslim world, they were in an advanced phase, right? We'll talk about that, how much more enlightened they were in, in the Middle East and North Africa than Europe was during the Middle Ages. So during the Middle Ages, this technique wasn't used, but it would have been used by the Romans, then forgotten, and then rediscovered by uh, Renaissance artists. Okay, let's finish with the last and most complex technique, scientific perspective. And again, I did define these last two. I, I modified this, so it's written down there for you. You don't have to write it. Um, that is a technique where an artist draws a series of diagonal lines. I'm pointing them to here for the drawing. They draw, uh, the artist uh, draws a series of diagonal lines on to a composition that all meet at a common vanishing point on the horizon. Oh, sorry. Let me get lit. Hi, David. Would you uh, we're just finishing up with the, you can catch what you missed, you know, uh, on YouTube after 8 p.m. on Friday after I posted. So let's finish up with this one, scientific perspective. These are the diagonal lines, not perfectly drawn. And there's a rather large vanishing point. Obviously, you know, this is not visible on the artist drawing, or it would look like they were really an amateur. You don't see the lines or the vanishing point. They're drawn with pencil or chalk or something light and then painted over. It should be obvious, but if it isn't, that's what you'll know. Some of you have done these uh, techniques yourself, haven't you? A number of you in your mini bios told me you studied art in a, a studio, a studio art drawing or perspective classes at the JC or somewhere else. So you may have done these techniques. So the point is that these lines 
would all converge, you can say, or meet, either word will do, uh, at a single vanishing point. If that's called single point perspective, you could have more than one vanishing point if you want to get really complex, but we, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. So I'm just talking about the, the earliest and simplest technique for depicting space using vanishing points is called scientific or single point perspective, but you can just call it scientific perspective. Why? Because it is the most scientific, accurate, and advanced technique ever invented by human beings to depict space on a two-dimensional work of art. There's no debating that. No one knew how to do it until the Italian Renaissance masters. In the early Italian Renaissance, they developed this technique. Some people argue the Romans had it, but you know what? No, because we know, because all those works of art, those frescoes in ancient Roman villas have been x-rayed and infrared and examined to death, and there are no vanishing points or diagonal lines underneath the paint. Whereas with the Renaissance painting, you can see that but only under the paint. They don't show up, of course, or the painting wouldn't look very professional. So the artist does that at the start of their composition. When they're drawing a cityscape, a landscape, a, a group portrait of people in a room or a single interior of a palace or whatever it is they're painting, if there's distance far enough back that you know they want the objects to look accurately uh, diminishing and see, so in a way it's, it is in fact a combination of diminishing size with these diagonal lines. Because what happens when they finish with the diagonal lines as they start painting over them? They place the objects along those lines and the further back those objects are, each one gets smaller. Again, it's just how human beings see with our limited capacity to see distance. Human eyesight perceives distance this way. And no one thought of it until the Italian Renaissance. Uh, and so we call it scientific perspective. And there are many other techniques in other cultures that we will talk about but the ones that are applicable for you to use in your papers are, are all the ones we're now, just now finishing. And there's one last thing about uh, space. <clears throat> when it comes to architecture, boy, I hope I don't get any of these kind of uh, comments from papers where the uh, person's writing about a, 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 or on a, on a test on, on the midterm or the final. This is a building, so there are no techniques for space. Eh, <laughs> you just dropped it. Of course, there aren't any techniques for space with architecture because architecture isn't imitating space. It's real space. So how do you write about space with a building? It's a totally different, but very easy to, to understand approach. You give the dimensions of that building, the height, the width, and maybe the two or three largest spaces or rooms inside. So like with the Empire State Building, it's 1,250 feet tall. And then you could say the largest two rooms are, I'm not, I haven't been there since, gosh, when I was in my early 30s. Uh, I think it's the, the lobby, you know, which is huge at the Empire State Building. And then maybe they have a ballroom or something. So you would just say the two largest spaces are X, Y, and Z, which are approximately 30 foot ceiling. And, you know, if you know the exact dimensions, you should give them. Certainly with a, a tall building, you should be able to find the height of the building, the number of stories or, or floors. And then maybe either the actual dimensions or measurements of the largest rooms or at least the relative sizes of those two or three largest spaces inside. That's describing real space. So with building, it's not techniques. There are no techniques of space. It's, it's all about real space. We've covered a lot. I know it's a lot for the first night. And so if you're not clear on every one of these totally crystal clear, don't get too uh, disconcerted uh, or, or uh, whatever. Uh, concerned because uh, you have time to, you know, obviously start uh, applying these techniques when you begin working on your papers. And you can ask me at any point if you want me to take a look at something you're writing or during class or by email after class. All right. Any burning questions anybody has right now? Because let's do the first two. Uh, we're going to be able to end early tonight, but since it's not even close to A, well, it's getting close. Uh, I want to do the first two of the. Um, uh, must know slides from ancient Near Eastern art. But before we get to that, one last time, any questions about any of these nine elements that we just covered? Anybody? Okay. Let's see if I can get this screen share to go because sometimes it fades when you don't. Oh, good. There it is. So make sure you guys can see all of it though. Get rid of this. Move it up here and enlarge this. Okay. Can you guys see this? Yes. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Good. Yeah. 
All right, let's just do two must knows. Let's take us right up to about eight or eight ish, and then we'll take our normal break, and then we should still end about nine uh, twenty ish, I would say, tonight, because we do have eight slides total. Okay, this one is face of a under uh, ancient Near Eastern art, face of a woman from Uruk. Uh, and the last word is the name of a city in ancient Babylon. U R U K. Capital U R U K. We get face of a woman from Uruk. The location is today that we always give the modern location, Iraq, the, the country Iraq. And the date is 3500 BC or BCE. So when we say ancient Near East, I didn't give you the context. I really should have started with that, but I want to get right into the slide. So let me just do that as part of the background or context, which is always part of the meaning of any of the slides from tonight. They all have this aspect in common. Ancient Near East implies what today most people call the Middle East, which would be everything between Turkey and Egypt and over as far as Iraq, I'm sorry, I meant Iran or Persia. All those countries in between, there are dozens of, or a dozen of them. You don't have to know the names of, but some of you know, there's Syria, there's Lebanon, there's Israel, there's Saudi Arabia, there's Kuwait, there's Egypt, and of course, Turkey itself, and then uh, Iran and Iraq. Uh, those countries, what today we call the Middle East, in the ancient world, they were called, uh, we, we use the term today to call them the ancient Near East, and the uh, oldest culture there was the early Babylonian Empire. This actually predates the Babylonian Empire, frankly. But the, the people who, who created this image of a woman's face, we'll talk about what, what may be going on here and what it's supposed to symbolize in just a moment. But whoever created this work of art would have been uh, pre-Babylonian, but they were the ancestors of what later, a few centuries later, became the early Babylonian Empire. That's the majority of what we're covering tonight is works from both the early Babylonian Empire and then the latter Babylonian Empire. That was the largest empire in the ancient Near East during the, their golden ages. So they had two major periods of expansion or golden ages in Babylon in the ancient Near East where they conquered most of the countries around them, right? And ruled them for centuries. And that's the early Babylonian Empire and the later Babylonian. So now we're looking at something that's even before that first Babylonian Empire. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a human, a uh, life-size image of a human female. So I'd start your, your notes on the meaning with um, this fact. This is the oldest intact life-size image of a human a face yet found in Western art. It's the oldest life-size intact image of a human face. Is it a face or a head? I'm going to say head. Look at it. It's not just the face. The neck and the back of the head are here, but Stockstead doesn't like to use the same title. Everyone else does. So we'll go with hers, but really I'm going to say head. I'll repeat that one more time. This is the uh, oldest life-size intact, right, image of a human face and head. We'll say it that way yet found in Western art. That's a major statement of fact that really distinguishes why this is so rare and precious and valuable. We'll say how valuable at the end of these notes. It was stolen once. <clears throat> at the end of the meaning part, I'll give you one little anecdote you could add as part of the meaning. But first, let's talk about the, the original meaning or purpose. Well, what is it? There's two leading theories. It's either a portrait of a real person, as in a high-ranking woman, like a noblewoman or priestess, pretty much it would have been the only two likely categories. It's either an actual portrait from life of a living person who is uh, important in that city of Uruk, the early Near Eastern city. And that would mean she would almost certainly be one of two things, a noble woman, right, from the upper classes, or a high priestess. Sometimes there were both, but usually it was one or the other. That's a theory most people, or most historians, I should say, believe, and I do too. And why? Why do most historians think this is an actual living person's portrait? Because of the detail. What do you notice about her hair? That's a little bit unusual for, or at least noticeable, I'll put it that way. Uh, let me let me do this. I want to get it close. No. Yeah, go ahead. What do you notice about her hair? I don't like... I'm sorry, you're fading. Uh, can you say that again? Uh, the, 
how is it styled? Yes, excellent. That's exactly the, the best way to put it in your notes. Everybody hear that? Yes, she has, her hair has been styled. Now, if this person was a poor peasant woman, right? Or not a portrait of a real living person who had had their hair styled, they, they wouldn't look like this. Their hair would not be emphasized the way this is. This woman's had her hair styled. Well, that would indicate someone of the upper classes right there, of course, in the, assuming that's an accurate image. So yes, that's the first thing uh, you should put in your notes. And then another is, the firm set of her jaw is how I think one or two art historians have put it. The way she's looking straight at us and her mouth, both and her jaw, let's get up close, very firm, right? She's not, well, in other words, kind of tenuous, right? Or the slightest bit self conscious. So what quality would you, could, if it's the portrait, just going with that theory, assuming it's true, of a real person who's high ranking, then what does the expression and the set of her, her, her mouth and her jaw tell us about what kind of personality she has or mindset or state of mind? A person's, ego. Um, ego, you can say ego, another word, go ahead, there's a second person. Stern, I would say. I'm sorry, I can't hear that word again, one more time. I thought it'd be stern. Well, that's interesting. Stern. Yeah, I, actually, I see why people, a lot of people have been saying that more recently. Well, okay, you could say stern or egotistical, but how about just a neutral term to describe whether or not she feels uh, any, I don't want to give it away. I'm still, you will see if anyone comes up with this. I uh, yeah, okay, she has a sense of her own importance okay self-confidence that that's what i would say that's that's not the only way to describe the expression uh, all the other points you guys made are accurate or valid but i think that overall this person if it's a portrait of a real person has a strong sense of self-confidence which shows in their expression i was just looking to see if there was someone with a question there uh and that that's because you can see that this is not someone who's shy right or uh feeling weak uh, or, or withdrawn. They, they are, you can say stern or strong, but I would say strong sense of self-confidence. And the final bit of evidence is the eyes. Now, of course, the eyeballs were stolen. That should be obvious. Thousands of years ago, whatever they're made out of gold, ivory, gems, you know, some kind of precious stones, probably. Uh, we know because we found a few like these, uh, these pieces that were intact in burial sites. This one, I don't think it was found like this by modern archaeologists. So, so once upon a time it had the eyeballs, but even without them, she is looking dead straight at us, isn't she? She is gazing straight at us without any hesitancy, any self-consciousness. So to me, that's yet another bit of evidence that she is a, a real person, a portrait of a real person with a strong sense of self-confidence and therefore probably a powerful woman from the upper classes. Okay, the other aspect of the, I mean, sorry, theory of, it, uh, of the meaning is that it might just be a generic, you know, or general image of a high priestess. You're cutting out a little bit. You're cutting Art. out. Okay, let me, let say me. Say it again? Yeah, I'll say you it. cut out for about 30 seconds. Sure, I know, that's been happening <laughs> the last two weeks. Let's, let's restate that. The other theory is that this is a general, the other word is, you could say is generic, the two words synonymous, generic, right? Or general image of a uh, high priestess without being a portrait, in other words, of an actual person. But to me, that begs the question, why so much emphasis on her you know, uh, styled hair and her expression and strong self-confidence if it wasn't an actual portrait of a real woman? I'm pretty sure most historians would agree it's probably the latter because the, the idea of doing an image like this without having someone pose for it just to have okay let's put this as a sculpture piece in our temple uh, just to just to imitate a high priestess it, that doesn't make much sense to me why wouldn't they actually sit down with a real high priestess the artist i mean the sculptor and use that person's personality to create this portrait as most historians believe it is. Okay, that's it on the meaning, except for one other fact. During the invasion of Iraq, as in the US invasion of Iraq, um, <clears throat> the museum, some of you know this, uh, the Baghdad Museum was looted by rioters, you know, in the chaos that ensued when the American army was moving into Baghdad. It's about 2003 now, 
Some of you won't remember that, but a few of you would, right? So what happened to this piece, this head of a woman or face of a woman from Uruk? It disappeared, not that night though. Weeks later, it disappeared from the museum collection. It survived the, the rioting and the chaos of yeah. the Where did it turn up? In the backyard of someone who worked for the museum, buried there by an employee who was about to sell it to a German thief. I you can just say thief, you can say German collector, but anyone that knows they're buying stolen art is a thief. He was gonna pay 10 million marks for it. You don't have to have that figure, just say millions of dollars, marks and marks. Yeah, pretty close in value. So you just say millions of dollars was going to be paid to this museum employee for this stolen head. Guess what? This story had a happy ending, honey, unlike some of the others during that period of, of Iraq's history, which is that one of the neighbors saw this uh, you know, museum employee bury the sculpture in his yard and called the local American uh, military headquarters, whatever that neighborhood was where they were patrolling and said, you come, come to this house and you'll see in the backyard a stolen art object. So the American military sent some soldiers there, they dug it up, it was intact luckily, and they returned it to the museum. It's still at the museum now with a lot stronger security. So that's a fact you could put in as the meaning if this is on the essay part of the midterm. It literally survived, you know, an attempted theft. Uh, but probably at the last minute, maybe hours before it would have been taken out of Iraq. And they arrested the German thief and the employee and threw them in prison, <clears throat> I'm sure, which they deserve. Okay, formal analysis, it's balanced. Yes, it's an attacked human head by definition. I would argue both top to bottom and left to right because the overall shape of the human head is pretty much, uh, you know, overall similar kind of an oval, of course, like most uh, intact human heads would be. Uh, the rhythm is obvious. The two eye sockets, you could say eye sockets, but you know, you just say eyes, two eyebrows, the bangs on the ha hair, the styled hairdo. You could actually see the ears too, if you look closely, and the nostrils. Now it was damaged, not during the theft that I just mentioned, but thousands of years ago at some point, part of the nose was, but still you can see the details. Two lips, two noses, I'm sorry, I meant two. <laughs> to nostrils and and so you see as i said earlier all human uh, portraits of intact human beings faces heads arms hands legs but are part of their bodies that by definition is rhythm is it stable or dynamic look carefully it is mostly stable because she is looking at us dead straight on upright and if you drew the outer you know edges of it it almost forms a rectangle here and everything is upright and straight, but of course it has several dynamic details. So it's both the hair, the bangs of the hair are dynamic. Obviously the eye sockets, the eyebrows um, and the chin. So it's a mixture. It's a cool, so oh, I misspoke, a warm yellow color of stone. And here I don't see some, well, maybe on the hair. Yeah, maybe the hair has simulated smooth tree, you know, like styled hair would. But the rest of it is the real rough texture of the stone. I don't know what kind of stone it is. You don't, you don't have to know that. The, the, the similar texture here that uh, there is around maybe just the lips and the hair, that's created by carved line. There's no other kind of line, line here, carved line. There's no technique for modeling, but there is there are shadows from the lighting of the museum. So there's the artificial light that creates uh, the effect of modeling, but no technique for modeling. For space, it's a life-size image, but it is uh, of an adult human woman. Uh, so it's about uh, a 10, 10 inch tall object from the neck to the top of the head with only one technique for overlapping and that's the hair, the hair overlaps the forehead. Uh, and then let's see, uh, what are we missing here? Shadows, modeling, texture. I know there's something I'm not there. Oh, mass. It's it's really uh, a single mass, but it's not solid, it's hollow, as you can see. So a single mass, roughly again, 10 inches tall, but, but uh, hollow inside. Okay, there's another view of it from below. Okay, we'll do one more and then we'll take a break. Uh, this is the best view. I've, I've experimented with others from online and it's an important, so, oh, I didn't, I, I apologize. I didn't say this, but we haven't yet moved on. So maybe make a note in the margin if that's what you're doing for what slides in each lecture, I always give you a heads up, are these most important ones for that evening or that lecture, which won't be cut from the study list for the midterm. And the first one was one and so is this. 
This is a very important one. Okay, it's the ziggurat of Ur. Z-I-G-G-U-R-A-T. Z-I-G-G-U-R-A-T of Ur. It's just two letters, the city. It was built with ancient. Now, this is Babylonian. Uh, by this time, they had an empire. Capital U-R. Ziggurat of Ur. Location, again, all of these are Iraq. And the date was 2100, 2100 BC or BCE. So now we're looking at uh, a fortified city that was built on top of a ziggurat. So here we have, that's the first definition for this tonight. It's on the first page of your list of terms, right? To know. Uh, a ziggurat was a Babylonian stepped pyramid. That's with an ED. Babylonian stepped pyramid, comma. Sometimes, I would underline that word, sometimes used as a fortified city, period. This one was. This was not only a step pyramid, because some of them were just that. They were just the pyramid by itself out in the desert. This one had the dual purpose of being a fortified city. So that's the majority of the meaning of the notes you should have on the meaning. How? How did they make a fortified city out of this? Well, it should be obvious in the picture. If it's not, you should write this. This is not all of there was. This is just the bottom level. So when it was intact, it was three levels that was 220 foot tall structure or pyramid. Stepped pyramid with three levels that rose to a height of 220 feet. That's part of the meaning, of course. That's pretty tall, isn't it? So how did they build a fortified city on top of the, each level? Well, here's how they did that. The first level which would be about where my cursor is when it was intact. And of course it's missing a section here, but most of that level is there. The first level had the homes of the, the working class. Well, that's what Marx would say <laughs> of the peasants, the workers. You can just say the workers or the poor or peasants. Their homes were mud huts and there were more than one family to each home. So we're talking about a couple of dozen people in each house. And there were hundreds of those houses, you know, lining uh, all four sides here. Of course, it's a four-sided step pyramid. So you could see if you do the math, say multiply 20 by 500, you're looking at a large number of people. That's thousands of people, poor working, you know, peasants would live uh, on the first level. Okay, on the second level, you might be able to guess, were the homes of the skilled laborers. That's the easiest way to describe the, the people who had a little better lifestyle, and they would have had homes made out of maybe uh, plaster and, and uh, possibly uh, wood or something a little more sturdy, and they wouldn't be quite so crowded. There would just be one family to each house, but back then, families could have 15 people, right? Father, grandfather, grandson. Yeah, they were extended families extended families on the second level the homes of the families who were skilled laborers merchants carpenters bricklayers you know people who had a little bit of an income so there there would be a, a few hundred homes with maybe only 12 15 people in each house but even if you do the math for that that's still maybe a thousand more people on the second level finally you can guess and the last part of the notes for this is on the top level were the homes of the ruling class, the wealthy. And there were only a few of them. And of course, they do have servants, though. So those homes might hold as many as 50 or 20 people, but there were only a couple of dozen of those. And they were large stone. We know this from the evidence of the archaeological evidence. Large, well-built stone houses, uh, even uh, you could say mansions on the top level where the ruling class lived. And finally, in the middle on the top level was the city temple the city temple, two words just like it sounds, where they had a statue of their god to protect that city. They, they Each city believed they had their own god in ancient Babylon, so they could protect that city from attack. And the final bit is here of the meaning, and, I'll, and then we'll take a break after we do a quick formal. I'll see these, these little slits. Those are windows, as be obvious. There's no glass in them. There's openings, you can just say openings, where the archers were posted, of course, 24-7. And of course, they had to be relieved back and forth. So there were tunnels between each of these windows so that the archers who defended the city from attack, the, you know, that the were outlooks or, uh, you know, they were there to look uh, across because we're in the desert. So you could see an enemy approaching from a long ways away. So these uh, little opening with the lookouts, I'm sorry, that's what I meant. Lookouts 
would be standing and the archers with their bow and arrows in case someone got too close, they could uh, of course uh, fire on them uh, with maybe flaming arrows or what have you. So they could protect the city, but the final uh, defense was the gate. So the peasants, obviously they were kicked in that case, they were forced to go out in the fields and you know work in the fields for probably sunrise to sunset and then come back in at night but if there was an attack or danger of a threat of some kind they could come running up these there would be a, a warning from a horn what else would it be some kind of horn uh and and then they'd know it was time to run back up into the uh for you know the gate through the gate which is missing obviously it's long gone it would have been metal probably which they would then lower as soon as everyone got inside the gate they'd lower it so this we don't know if it was ever conquered or taken over by an enemy attack but it was pretty well defended so that's why we say this was a fortified city on top of the ziggurat but not all ziggurats were fortified cities remember that that's plenty on the meeting. Okay, let's wrap up the formal analysis and then we'll take a break. We'll call it 8.05 to how about 15 minutes to 8.20. It's balanced. Oh, it was totally balanced when it was new, but it is weighted toward the bottom. Left to right, it was completely symmetrical. Of course, you have to visualize what it would look like. Uh, <clears throat> and yet, by all definitions, all pyramids are always there weighted or unbalanced toward the bottom. The rhythm is obvious with the stairs, the slits or, or openings here. Uh, and then, of course, the walls have different patterns of uh, stone. This is actually brick, so it's the real texture. There's no similar texture. A real rough brick and real rough stone are used to create this. Uh, it, this is how it looks now, even though this is a very old picture. That's about a 55 Chevy there. <laughs> uh, because I had two students in my class who were in the uh, one of the uh, U.S. Army units that were assigned a husband and wife. I was surprised at the same outfit. I didn't think they ever did that. And they came back and showed during spring break. Uh, they came back from Iraq and showed us slides of this uh, structure. It's exactly looks like this to this day. Just the bottom portion is left. Okay, then is it stable or dynamic? Well, of course it's it's both. The staircases are dynamic, and the the uh, you know tapering. That's the only word for them. Tapering. I guess you could say slanting or slanted. Corners are dynamic, but the overall walls themselves were stable. Uh, then we had the color. Well, we don't have a slide of it in color that I could find that, that was sharp and clear. So you just have to say it's a warm sand color, literally an earth tone, a warm sand color. Uh, and then the modeling is just the shadows created from the sun. For space, it was 220 feet, uh, feet tall, right? Three levels, 220 feet tall. And you could say it was a single mass or break it down into three different masses. The, obviously, if you do that, the largest mass was the first level. The second largest was the middle level, of course, and the smallest mass would be the top level. And it was not hollow or solid. <laughs> it was both. Obviously, there are tunnels carved between these windows or these outlooks. So you could just say it was mostly a solid object uh, in terms of mass, but it did have some tunnels worked. And then the line here is all visual. So we're wrapping it up now, right? When the sun creates, you know, there's no modeling techniques, just natural shadows. It creates the, the illusion of a uh, line. It's called visual line. Okay, let's take a 15 minute break. That's long enough for everybody. All right. All right, see you back at 8.20. Okay, so hopefully everyone's back and we can resume and we still should be, like I said, be out in several minutes early, depending on how many questions you guys have. You can see how this picture wouldn't have been as good. It's just not as sharp. And this one's too dark. It was the only two other images I saw online. Okay, but for this one, I did find recently an improved image for the next must know. And this is a pretty important slide too. Uh, this one is, um, <clears throat> panels from a bull liar. Panels, plural. Panels from a bull liar is L Y R E. It's a kind of musical instrument, a harp, like an early version of a harp. Okay, the location, again, all of these tonight are the same country Iraq, 2685 BC or BCE. So, what are we looking at? We're looking at bow relief panels, and that requires us to give you the next, or me, to give you the next definition. It's not a long definition. Each of these four panels on the end of a musical instrument that's a harp-like ancient instrument called a lyre, 
uh, each of these panels is in bas relief. So here's that definition. <clears throat> a bas relief is a two dimensional work of art with raised figures off a flat background. A two dimensional work of art with raised figures off a flat background. Well, that's exactly what we're looking at here. So we're going to talk about what, what each of these bas relief panels depicts what's going on here. But you should have, everybody got that definition now? Because that could come up on the, very likely will come up on the midterm. Sorry, it's off a flat background, you said? Yeah, it's a two-dimensional work of art with raised figures off a flat background. Thank you. Sure, yeah, and, and this what exactly is what we're looking at. Now, the next definition, <laughs> is relating to this slide as well. So there's two definitions. Oh, just a minute, I just stubbed my toe, the one I just had surgery on. I'm sorry, give me a second. Oh, oh that wasn't good. Okay, <laughs> on the leg of my table I'm sitting at. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Starting over. <laughs> Animal style is two words. You see it's near the bottom of your list of terms. That definition applies to this slide. Okay, so you again, this could come up very easily on the midterm. Either, you know, when it comes to the, the uh, meaning of this slide, if this was on the midterm, or as a standalone definition. So here we go, animal style. Now, this is not a short definition, but it's a single sentence. So here we go. I'll say it slowly and repeat it, okay? Animal style was a style of art, sure, a style of art in the ancient world, comma, a style of art in the ancient world, comma, in which animals were depicted with human-like characteristics, comma, in which animals were depicted with human-like characteristics, comma, and often engaging in human-like behavior, and often engaging in human-like behavior. That's exactly what we see here. I'll repeat that one more time. Uh, it's a style of art in the ancient world in which animals were depicted with human-like characteristics, comma, and often engaging in human-like behavior. Well, it, you should already be able to tell that fits this to a T. This is exactly what we're looking at. Four different panels of animals behaving much more like human beings than animals. And they're engaged in, you know, various human-like activities. So what do we have here? Well, the one totally human figure is the hero. Now that is the right word. Hero has been turned into something totally different in modern times. But in the ancient world, it meant half human, half God. It literally had no other meaning. If you, one parent was a human and the other was a god, yes, the gods came down to earth and had sex with humans. If you don't know your ancient mythology, you should know that fact. Uh, and then the offspring would be a superhuman, like Hercules. Hercules was a hero. And of course, the word is morphed into meaning someone who's brave and does brave deeds. But back in the ancient world, it was very specific. So half human, half god is this guy here. He's the only one who's not uh, an example of an animal or, you know, part animal behaving like a human. That is a human being. So what's he doing? We'll say he's uh, super strong. He is crushing two bulls. You may or may not know how much bulls weigh, but bulls are at least a thousand pounds, sometimes much more than that. There's no way a normal human being could lift and then crush two bulls, one in each arm. He obviously is superhuman, super strong. But look at the bulls. They're clearly part human and part animal. They have human faces and beards, and then their bodies are obviously animals. So that's part of the animal style. Then we'll go down to this panel. I love this, my favorite. The uh, Well, one of the two favorites. Uh, the second panel down is... Um, a lion and a jackal going to a party and the jackal is carrying cooked heads of his own species <laughs> on a tray and the lion's carrying wine both a jug of wine and a goblet of wine so that what did you say 
Pardon? Pardon? What do you say? A jackal? Jackal. Jackal. You know, the animal. Jackal. Right? I mean, there's no other word for it, right? That's a particular kind of animal uh, that you see here. This is the jackal. That's, of course, obviously a lion there. Okay, so let's now go to the third panel. Actually, this is the one I think is the most entertaining. These are meant to be humorous, by the way. This is meant to be whimsical. I'll explain what, what this was used for in a minute. But let's just talk about the other two panels. What do we see here? The musician panel. Well, are these normal human musicians? Of course not. You've got a bear who is snapping his paws in time to the music. And then you've got a donkey who's actually playing the lyre. That's what this is. There's the bull head on the panel we're looking at. See, that is this panel. You get the, it's an image within an image, of course. It's very clever, actually. Uh, so there's your lyre, a harp-like instrument being played by a donkey who has fingers, which is ridiculously human, of course. And then you have a really funny image here. Whoops, sorry. A drinking goat, a goat getting drunk on uh, wine from wine goblets. But the bear is maybe the most ridiculously out of character for a real bear. He's snapping his paws slash fingers. Of course, they don't have fingers uh, in time to the music. So it's the musician panel. I call you can call it whatever you want. And then the last one is the half scorpion, half human panel with his buddy, the two-fisted drinking goat. Now, you don't have to write that, but that's how I see these animals. I mean, of course, a goat can. He's got hoofs and can't hold on to two goblets of wine, but it looks like he's saying, here, sir, here's your wine and here's mine. Let's just have some, a party tonight. So it's, a, it, it's meant to be whimsical. So the last part of the meaning is that the reason for this was that this was created to illustrate the royal family's entertainment with this instrument where they hired some talented musician to play a lyre, but the panels were also meant to entertain the visitors because the panels would bring a smile to anybody's face when they know what they're looking at. And this was created for the emperor in, this is ancient Babylon. Now remember, this is the early Babylon empire in which these, these images uh, were used to um, entertain while the instrument was being played. Anybody heard a harp solo? No. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> harps are beautiful. It's short, it's small. Oh, harp solo. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you listen to a harp solo for half an hour, you're going to want to be entertained. I don't know if anybody knows. No, well, it's the quickest. The, Har the Marx Brothers movies where Harpo, the character named after, because he played harps, those are always the most boring part of their movies. <laughs> Everybody got up and left. No. It's just say this is meant to entertain on several levels. The harp itself, or oh, it's not a harp, the instrument, the lyre, would be entertaining musically. Then, of course, it was probably singing, right, and other instruments. And then there's just these images, which would make people smile, if not laugh, when they're looking at this. This is, by the way, in the museum in Baghdad, this, this piece of, uh, it's wood wood with bas relief figures of mother of pearl. You don't have to know that, but let's now segue to the formal analysis. Well, the modeling isn't obvious here, but there is some because the figures are raised off of a flat background. What is that made out of painted black wood? So that contrast, that creates a kind of modeling, doesn't it? The light areas are the figures, <laughs> the objects, the scene with uh, you know the instruments and the food and wine and of course the uh, animals and the half people, half animals, all the figures. So those are in contrast to a dark background. So that's a type of modeling, but there isn't a realistic detailing of the figures. They, they don't have modeling. So each individual figure is not modeled, but the area around them is, you could say it that way. The rhythm is very obvious. The arms, hands, legs, heads, uh, and, and different objects, uh, lots of repeated shapes. Each panel is roughly balanced. That one I would be pretty insistent on saying, because really, if you look carefully, there's a careful placement of animals with the same height and same overall size of their bodies on either side, right? Two, two, or two, two, and two. Although this goat may be a little skinnier than the half scorpion man, uh, when you add that giant wine vase or, you know, uh, behind him there, I you, you pretty much could say it's roughly balanced. So that one, some people might say is weighted or slightly unbalanced toward the left. Um, each figure is about the same size on each set. So I don't think you can say there's larger and smaller masses. These two bulls, these two uh, animals here, 
these two playing, you know, or listening and playing the instrument there in the musician panel, they're, they're roughly the same size. Oh, and this one though, yes, the largest mass is the scorpion man, then the goat and then the vase. Uh, for space, the only technique is overlapping. These are not register lines because these are not all in the same room at the same time being further away from us. They're separate rooms. We know because th there's inscriptions. So we know what this was done. We don't have to guess what, who created it and what for and how it was used. We have records by this time of what this was made for. So these are separate rooms at different times where different events are happening in the palace, right? So these are not register lines. They're just uh, self-contained scenes, each of these. So there's only overlapping use, obviously the, here overlaps the two bowls, and of course the animals here overlap what they're carrying, and the the uh, donkey overlaps the instrument, and so forth. Um, the line here is both bold and thin. I'd say it's mostly bold on the upper panel, at least on the bowls it is anyway, but thin on some of the details of their faces. And down here, the musician, or sorry, the second panel, I mean, is it's mostly thin outline as it is on the musician panel. And then back down here with the scorpion man, that's bold line. So you can see a, obviously a mixture of both. Um, and then we have, uh, let's see, stable mostly, mostly stable. The, the, the uh, various figures are upright, except for the backs of these two bowls. Uh, of course, there are dynamic details in each panel, mostly the tops of their heads and or you know, this wide goblet, but even it's upright mostly. So most of the objects are, are standing upright, human, animal, or an, uh, inanimate. All of the objects are pretty much upright. So it's mostly stable. And the color is neutral. It's an off-white. Mother of pearl is not, you know, warm, definitely. So that's a, it would be cool if it was next to red, but it's black painted background. Remember black and gray or black and white together are neutral, neither cool nor warm. Okay, let's see. Did I cover everything? Shading one. Yeah, the texture. Did I say texture? Yeah, texture. No, I don't think I did. It's really. No. Yeah, the simulated texture is superb on the beards, right? And uh, on the lion's mane and on this um, giant wine <laughs> face. Uh, even on the bear and uh, the, uh, well, the donkey, a little less so, but the bear's fur. It's well done. And that's all done with uh, painted line. Well, carved and painted line. That's how the line is done inside each figure. But of course, there's the outline. I already said bold and thin outline. Okay, any questions before we move on? The next one will be uh, a little bit less detailed. So it took as long to describe, but it's, it's on the syllabus. So it is uh, one of the must notes for tonight. It's head of a ruler from Nineveh. That's N-I-N-E-V-E-H, head of a ruler from Nineveh. The location is Iraq, of course, and the date is 2300 or 2300 BC. So what do we have here? Well, we have a bronze, right, casting of a portrait of a real person. Now this one, there's not much debate on that. It's an actual individual who posed for this portrait. When we say a ruler from Nineveh, that pretty much tells you without saying in so many words that this guy was the local ruler for the city of Nineveh. He would have been a governor today. We might call him a governor or even a mayor, you know, depending on if he just ruled the town or the province around it. So it's either a mayor or governor. In other words, a local official who would, of course, be acting uh, in behalf of the emperor in a town, one of the biggest towns in the ancient Babylonian, the earlier Babylonian empire was around at this time. Nineveh was one of the most prosperous and I think largest cities of the early Babylonian empire. But there's more to the meaning than just that fact. Look at his face and see whether you get a sense of his personality or how he might have uh, been as a ruler. Look at the expression on his mouth, his eyes, and how he's looking towards somebody who's talking to him, and he seems to be listening. You know, obviously one of his subjects has come to his palace. I mean, what else would this be? He's having an audience, you know, listening to someone with a problem. That's his job, of course, as a local ruler. So anybody want it? Again, there's no absolute right or wrong here, but what kind of a uh, personality or, or type of ruler do you think you can gather he would be from the clues of a, his expression on his face? 
Mm. Kind? Yes, yes, very, yes, very good. kind or benevolent. You can use either word. Oh. He did seem to be that way. And we don't think there's any doubt that the person who created this image was doing that from a real life, you know, a portrait of a real person who posed for this. So the fact that he has a benign, that's another word, big nin, that's my aunt in Indiana, says B-E-G-N-I-N, I can never spell that word either. <laughs> you could just say kind is fine uh, or uh, benevolent. There we go. That word is phonetic, benevolent or kind ruler. Probably he was because so many rulers in the ancient world were, were cruel and arrogant and he usually shows in their, their portraits, their faces. But this guy seems to be kind or, or benevolent. The two words are pretty much synonymous. What's the other facts about the meaning you should have? Well, look at how he's dressed. And that tells us he's a ruler, even if we didn't know that he was <clears throat> from other evidence. He's wearing a ruler's headdress. That is hand tool leather, extremely refined or detailed, you could say. <clears throat> hand tooled leather headdresses were reserved for the ruling classes. Very, very expensive. If you look at it, you can see that if you get up close. <clears throat> but he's also got his hair back in a bun. Sorry, I may have to go get a drink of water. <clears throat> Let me see if I can. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't do that during the break. Uh, the, the hair in the back tied in a bun. These are all clues. These are all unmistakable clues of a ruler. The hand tool, fancy, you can say leather headdress and the hair pulled back and tied in a bun. Those were the uh, stylistic features of a ruler. But the most obvious clue is the beard. The, this is a fact you will hear it over and over again between now and the midterm. In the ancient world, the longer the beard, the wiser and more important the person. Again, the longer the beard, the wiser and more important the person. At least they believe that in their artistic uh, symbolism that they were using. So this guy was a ruler, apparently benign and probably therefore fairly wise and experienced, confident, all those good things. But his beard indicates his his stature, his importance. It's a very prominent beard, isn't it? It's it's not only long, it's it's very fancy. So that indicates he's a very powerful and a, a wise person. Okay, now the fact that it's bronze should tell you that it might or might not, I mean, sorry, that it ends here, that this is not part of the statue. That should be obvious that that's the museum's concrete base to support this hollow bronze head. It's hollow, of course. So it, it might or might not have had the whole body below the neck once originally attached to it, but we, we have no way of knowing. So all we know is now it's just the head uh, above above the neck uh, and that the rest of this is just the museum display stand. Okay, formal analysis, it's the real color here is a warm bronze color, you know, dark, well, it's, you could just say bronze, or that's pretty much what it is. It's an earth tone, obviously not cool. The similar texture, it's superb, isn't it? You can almost feel that leather, what it would feel like if you touched it. And then of course his skin, which also is the real texture of the bronze. So you got both the real texture, like all sculpture is, on the mostly visible on the skin. And then the beard and the hair tied back in the bun, that's, that all has to do with the, uh, you know, carved line, which was used, of course, to create this piece. Obviously, first it was made in clay. I think everybody knows that. Bronze starts out as clay, and then you cast it. So the lines were carved. Uh, and they create the realistic, very sharp, realistic cement textures of the beard, the hair, the headdress, the face. Uh, and those were carved lines. Okay, and then we have balance. Well, it was when it was intact. I'll show you what it looks like from the front. <laughs> Obviously, it's been vandalized. But even with what's missing, big chunks of the eye sockets and the eyeballs, you can still see it was balanced roughly left to right and top to bottom as an intact human head would be. And yeah, look how prominent that beard is from this angle. Okay, uh, and then we have, if it's on the exam, this is the view because I think it shows his benign or benevolent or kind expression more clearly. And it doesn't look so badly damaged. Okay, is it stable or dynamic? Well, it's both, but it's more stable than dynamic because the beard forms almost a straight line, doesn't it? And even the face, except for the nose, 
up to the, the uh, top of this head. And then this is almost the right angle here. So it's more stable than dynamic. There's no question of that, but, but it's both. It wouldn't be incorrect to say just that because the top of his head and the hair and the bun in the back, of course, and the eyes and nose are, are dynamic. Okay, and then it's a single hollow object. So it's a single mass, it's hollow, not solid. Again, if something is three-dimensional and it's, you're describing the mass, you're gonna to wanna to say, is it hollow or solid? This is hollow, single mass, uh, and it, it is about, it's a life-size human head. So of course with the beard, it's about uh, 18 inches tall from the bottom of the beard. Okay, and then we have, uh, let's see, for space, there's only, it's a re again, real space, I just said about 18 inches tall, but it does have the technique of overlapping. Obviously the headdress overlaps the forehead and the beard overlaps the face. Let's see, modeling is just the shadows from the museum lighting. I think this is also in the back of the museum, but I'm not sure about that. Okay. That one I didn't say was so important, it absolutely won't be cut from the study list. It might or it might not. But this one absolutely will not be cut from the study list. It's a very important work. And you'll look at it and say, I can't, how can we talk about it if it's on the test? Don't worry, the actual image that you'll see is this if it's on the test. But I needed you to see the context so you'll understand in a minute why I'm showing you. It's my own slide that I took at the Louvre Museum in Paris. But here's the title of the next must know. Again, really high possibility of being on the midterm. Steely, S-T-E-L-O, first word, Steely. I know it looks like the name Stella, a woman's name, but it's pronounced Steely. S-T-E-L-A, Steely of Hammurabi. That's H-A-M-M. U-R-A-B-I, H-A-M-M-U-R-A-B-I. If it's on the exam, you'll have the syllabus in front of you, remember, open note, open book, open, um, to, you know, right? But I've seen people mistakenly, mistakenly put two Bs in the name. If you put two Bs in Hammurabi's name, you just made him Jewish. and He wasn't Jewish, he's not a rabbi. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm saying. With two Bs, he would be a rabbi. No, it's one B, two Ms, one B. Location, again, by now, everyone knows it's, it's all the same tonight. Iraq, and the date is 1750 BC. So it's in the Louvre, that's a 15 foot high piece of stone. So let's define steely before we get into the meaning of this slide. Okay, a steely is a large piece of stone, that's what you're looking at here, carved with the scene of an important event from that culture's history. A large piece of stone carved with the scene from an important event of that culture's history. That's exactly what we're gonna focus on for the notes here. But let's finish the definition, comma. <laughs> Okay, and often with writing below it. So I'll say that over again. A steely is a large piece of stone carved with a scene from an important event of that culture's history. This is a Babylonian, early Babylonian steely, carved with an, a scene of an important event from that culture's history and often with writing below. Well, there's your writing. By the time this steely was carved, Babylon had developed its own alphabet, its own language. And so what's the writing? Well, here's the most important fact about this very important slide. This is the oldest law book or law codes yet found in the ancient world. Uh, sorry, Western, I have to say Western. Again, the oldest law books or law codes uh, ever found or yet sorry you can say it either way yet or ever found in the western world that that's saying a lot it's nearly four thousand years old and this is the oldest existing set of laws we've ever found in you know maybe Where are the laws uh the laws are right there and they all are marked with the two parts of each of these codes you know what so you most of you've seen law books right i mean even if you never have a reason to open one they're all over the place in every courthouse and la lawyers offices right and tv shows and like, yeah, and then, like, like was there like a translation or um, is the language still untranslated 
Say again? Do you, do I was asking you if oh, yeah. Things. Yeah, we, is that's what you're asking? Yes, we know what these laws were. For instance, if a man be convicted of or found guilty or whatever phrase we use of stealing a loaf of bread, his right hand will be severed from his arm. Yeah, that's one of the, see, it was the laws that you weren't supposed to break and the punishment for breaking them. And there were thousands of them. See, you, that's why I showed you this piece. If you just do the math, look at that. You just saw a few hundred laws just in the top few uh, you know, inches. So on both sides, this is covered with thousands of laws. Of course, you're running an empire of tens of millions of people, well, at least 10 million people. Um, and you have dozens and dozens of provinces and cities that you're ruling. You're going to want to control them with a very strict enforcement of the law, right? It's like yeah. a cylinder shape. Like, yeah, it kind of is, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you saw the other view. Do you want me to go back to it? I mean, it's a tall, narrow yeah. piece of film with a curved top. And that illustration, you can just barely see the bottom of the, the panel, which is going to be what you'll see if it's on the exam. It's just this section. But look how many laws there are. It's at least a thousand, I think it is, on each side. And of course, they go on the other side, too. So you could just say hundreds and hundreds or a few thousand, if you want to. Laws are carved with the punishments for breaking them right below the scene. So that's where the definition I just gave you, I'll have that now for a, a steely comes in. This is a very classic example of a steely used as a law book <laughs> made out of stone, right? Can you imagine having to study from this and take it home every night? No, just <laughs> under your arm <laughs> to your apartment if you're in law school. No, of course, there were no law schools then, but there were lawyers. Oh yeah, lawyers are one of the oldest professions in the world. You know that, right? There were lawyers all the way back to Jericho. We saw Jericho last week. Remember? Yeah, there were lawyers in biblical, really early biblical times. Probably not in the cave uh, uh, dwellers' times, but certainly anytime there's a city, there's going to be lawyers. Urban culture, there are going to be lawyers. So how are these uh, interpreted? And who are these two figures? That's the most important part of the meaning. Well, one of them is the Emperor Hammurabi, for whom the piece is named, and the other is the, quote, law giver God. That's literally how they would have translated in English the, the name of this guy. The, the Emperor who? Pardon? The Emperor who? Law giver God. That's what the phrase I'm using. We don't know, the, I don't know the name of that God. I'm sure it's some kind of Middle Eastern word that's hard to pronounce. But what you should focus on now, okay, is can you guys tell? I mean, should be obvious. The clues are very powerful here. Which one of these two figures, the one on the left or the right, is the God? The one that is sitting with the yeah. stone. Yes, exactly. For you, you already named one of the reasons one of the symbols of the, this uh, card. And of course, this is bas relief. That should be obvious, this bas relief, right? This bas relief panel, the symbols that mark this guy, the one on right, the right as the God are, as you just said, uh, that he's seated. And the guy standing is always a less important person. That's, that's, it's even today that's the case, right? You go into someone's office, right? And they're the CEO or the CU, whatever the coup. They're going to stay seated. And you're going to be standing until they tell you to see. So, so yeah, the seated guy is the more powerful. The God obviously is overpowering, the, uh, is much more powerful than a king or an emperor. So that's Hammurabi. That's the law. I'll say it again, three words, law giver God. So he's seated. He's on a throne. That marks him as, you know, uh, powerful. And then if that's not enough, he's got a divine headdress. You see the difference? There's the same kind of headdress we just saw, a little less ornate than the one on the ruler from Nineveh, but it's a hand-tooled leather headdress with the hair, right, just tied up in the back. And so that's a ruler's headdress. This is divine, and meaning only gods could have this kind. It looks like a, some people say a hornet's nest. <laughs> it's a spiral headdress, but just keep it simple, call it a divine, you know, God's divine, the word means God's divine headdress. So that marks him as a God. And if that's not enough, his beard is way longer than Hammurabi's. The longer the beard, remember, the more powerful and supposedly wise, mm -hmm. wiser the person. And finally, guess we got five clues here, right? If you case people who couldn't read, most people couldn't read back then, of course, saw this, they would understand who is who here without having to have it explained to them. That's a scepter. 
Scepters, of course, are a symbol of authority. And who has the power? The one that gives that authority to the king. So the lawgiver God is passing the power to enforce those laws back down on earth. Of course, they're not on earth here, right? Gods don't live on earth. It's up on some mountain somewhere. So guess what? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Some ruler, important person, and a uh, human being goes up to a mountain and meets a god and gets a bunch of laws and comes back down. Moses. Yeah, exactly. It's the same idea. You see, that's, I know everyone knows this. I'd be preaching to the choir to say this, but it just seems so tragic, a waste of, of the human culture and, and, and energy for people with different religions to fight. And it's so dumb because basically the concepts are the same whether you agree or disagree with them it's the ideas the, the stories the, the the meanings of them are very similar yeah so the earliest stories in the jewish faith about moses have a parallel here in babylon and these people were not despite hammurabi's name sounding like he's a rabbi he was not jewish so you see how much similarity there is of course um Anyway, so it's an interesting parallel. You could add that as the last fact about the meeting is that this was, um, you know, a, uh, <clears throat> a set of law codes that were, you know, uh, for the first time ever carved into stone, but there were parallels in, in other cultures, in other parts of the Middle East, such as the Jews with Moses. Right? Exactly. Same story, really. Uh, and then, of course, what happened to this is it was placed in the palace. First, only the emperor, Ramarabai, would have it, but then he had copies made. I guess you could add one more fact about the meaning. And he had them sent to all the local rulers, like that guy from Nineveh would have had a copy of this in his, his, his uh, palace, because he, he would have to consult it when it came time to punish someone for breaking these laws. He didn't have to guess. The emperor wanted him to know exactly what the punishment was for each uh, law that was broken. So this was exact copies of this were made and shipped all over. By the way, how did it end up in Paris? You don't have to write this. I think it was Napoleon. I'm almost certain. But one of the French invaders, I mean, who else would it be probably, uh, came to this part of what's now Iraq and found it buried and took it back with no questions asked, no permission, just expropriated, stole it, however you want to word that. And that's why it's in the Louvre now. It's been there for over 200 years. So is there other? Pardon? You say that it should be like copies. Um, oh, yes, there were copies. They have made. Yes, this is the original okay. thing that the actual emperor had made, but we don't know that for sure. But copies would have had to be made. Do you know why? Because the empire was so big that it would take days to go between all the cities, right? So to enforce the laws and punish people for breaking them, there had to be these copies of this made for each local ruler. You see what I mean? They would have had for random information. Do you know if, um, have they found other? Oh, have they found others? Oh, good question. Uh, you know, not that I'm aware of, but if someone wants to do research for extra credit, it's possible because it's been 200 years since this was found. So it's possible, but I don't think so. Maybe in pieces, possibly, you know, fragments. That's probably the case, but I haven't even read enough recently to be sure about that. But I don't think any other intact. No, there, we, it definitely is the oldest intact one. So that's how, you know, they can date things. Everybody knows this. You don't have to write this. Carbon dating, right? It's a scientific mm -hmm. process. It's been around for, oh, 100 years or close to it. And, and then it can, within a few decades, they can date what an object uh, was originally, you know, created if it, if it has any kind of uh, residue of carbon and so forth. I don't know the details. I'm not a scientist, obviously. So all I can say is we know this is the oldest one. I actually said that. You all have that in your notes, right? That this is the oldest intact law book or set of laws ever found and yet found, I should say, in the Western world. So others were made probably within the next few decades, you know, maybe you know, a generation or so later. As the empire expanded and, of course, different cities grew, they needed copies of this. It's it, They couldn't pass it around from one city to another. That wouldn't work. They'd have to have the laws right there in each palace of each ruler of like each province, right? You see what I mean? Yeah, but I, it's a good question you ask. I don't know if other copies have been found. Anybody want to do some research on that? And, and whatever the answer is, if you send me a link with an article of a page or more, you get five points for that. I'd be curious to know. I No one's ever asked that question before, <laughs> believe it or not. Good question. Okay, form analysis. Roughly balanced? Well, yes, because the, the, he's seated and the tops of their heads are the same, but actually, 
This is where looking more carefully would get you a different answer. Yeah, it is unbalanced toward the right because that lawgiver God is a bigger uh, figure. If he stood up, he'd be much taller than Hammurabi. So you could say technically, even though it appears to have a rough balance as, as, as it is currently composed with the th one figure seated, technically speaking, it's unbalanced because uh, to the right, because the largest mass is the God, then Hammurabi, then the throne. Right? For this, there is only overlapping. One line does not register line make. There's no uh, different groups of objects or people fading into the, it's just two people in the same room at the same distance. So only overlapping is used of the clothing over their bodies, their beards over their faces, their headdresses, and of course the throne over the seated God. All of the cement textures are excellent, aren't they? But there's the real smooth texture of the stone. By the way, it's a, the hardest stone known to, I think, to, possible to carve by human hands. You don't have to know that. It's called diorite. It's so hard. Well, look, it has already any damage. This might have been bullet, uh, target practice by a French soldier. Some people think that's a bullet hole or what's left of one from a stupid invading soldier shooting up somebody else's heritage. It happens. We all know that. But we don't know that. All we know is it's in pretty good shape for having been buried for thousands of years, isn't it? And that's because the real hard texture, real it actually is. You think that's smooth? You, you decide. Is it smooth or rough? The closer you get it, the rougher it looks, isn't it? Yeah. So you can say smooth, real, rough texture of the stone is in the background. And then all of the cement textures are sharp and realistic on the hair, the clothing, the beards. Uh, and uh, so that's all done with carved line. It is a completely neutral color. Of course, it's black. The stone itself literally is the color of my first slide, black. <laughs> no warm color here. And the modeling is, is obviously very powerful. I mean, when you get a bas relief panel, it, by definition, modeling is part of the design because without that, you don't see the figures. So the raised figures have a, a light and shadow around their edges of their bodies. And that's created by the museum, in this case, the uh, lighting of the museum. Uh, stable, totally. I mean, there's almost nothing dynamic except their headdresses, e even the lawgiver's arms. There's a slightly dynamic angle to the, to the upper arm of Hammurabi, but look closely. They're both, he's seated at right angle, upright. The throne is stable. Uh, this arm is stable. His beard is, it's, it's mostly stable with some dynamic detail, of course. Uh, the rhythm is obvious, the arms, hands, heads, and the folds of their robes. Okay, I think that's everything on this, right? Yeah. Okay, another view of it. That's kind of nice. Yeah. Uh, but see, this isn't as tall as the one at the Louvre. It's just strange. So this might be a copy. Hmm. See, doesn't this look, I suddenly realized, I, I, you know, like any teacher who's not wanting to get burned out, I look at the internet and try to add and, and take away sometimes images that aren't as good as the ones I had last semester. So I just, I think it was between me and my daughter or maybe my wife we found. See, that looks different, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's take it just for a second and see. I don't think this was damaged like that. Well, no, maybe it was. It's hard to tell. Yeah, maybe there was a divot, that, you know, a, de a dent in it. But it doesn't look as tall as the one in uh, the Louvre. Let's go back to that. If I could do them side by side, I would, but I don't have that. See, that, that to me, that's clearly taller. Having stood, it's 15 feet tall. I have that I stood there, right there, taking a picture. Well, with the base, the base is probably two feet. So it's at least 12 to 13 feet. All right, let's move on to the next must know here. And the last two are disturbing images, I'm gonna warn you, but they're an important part of the history of the ancient Near East. So we have uh, actually three more images. Asher Naz, this next one is Asher Nazarpal. That's A-S-S-U-R-N-A-S-I-R-P-A-L. Again, these are in front of you spelled out on the syllabus, so I'm not gonna say them more than once, okay? We kind of want to end early. We, we might be able to if we keep going. Asher Nazarpal, the name of the king that's in the chariot there. Killing lions, Iraq, the location, and 850 BC. I like to say that the first three letters of this guy's name say what he was. <laughs> because what we're looking at is animal abuse, pure and simple. But it isn't obvious. Why? Because this is a bas-relief panel roughly 
one third life size, it's all part of the meaning. I've seen it. it's at the British Museum in London. It's a bow relief panel, about one third life size, showing the king of Assyria. Now you got to get that right because it's not the modern country, it's the forerunner of it, very early ancient version of Syria with an S. This is not that. It's that's the current country. It's with a capital A S S. Y R I A. You don't have to worry about the spelling of words that aren't on the syllabus, but you might as well get them right in your notes at least to start with. So this is the Assyrian kingdom, not the Babylonians. They had conquered the entire Middle East. They were a powerful, warlike, well, they all Asian cultures were, but very brutal. That's the word I'd use towards all their conquered provinces or peoples. And they also abused animals even more than most ancient cultures. I'll explain in a couple of moments. But first we'll say, here's the emperor of the Assyrian kingdom at the high point of their power, their, their golden age. They only last about 150 years. I don't know, that might seem like a long time to people today, but in the ancient world, that's nothing. I mean, Rome lasted 600 years, right? The, the Egyptians, 3000 years. The ancient Greeks, 1200 years. So. 150 years is why. Why didn't they last as long as the other empires? Because of their enemies. They made enemies everywhere they went. They were so cruel that eventually the other kingdoms overthrew them. They're conquered kingdoms. The, the Jews, they conquered the Jews and they rebelled as, you know, if you have Jewish family or friends or no Jewish history. And they conquered the Babylonians who were powerful enough to throw them out eventually. So they only ruled for, you know, say about 150 years over most of the Middle East, but this was during their, their height of their power. So here he is, the king of Assyria in a chariot. And why was this bas relief panel? Obviously it's bas relief, right? Uh, why was he having himself portrayed this way? Because he wanted, this was in the palace. This is a panel that would have been displayed in his palace in their capital city. I'm not sure what the name of it was. Not Babylon, right? This is a different uh, culture. Um, and they wanted the king and his you know, advisors, everyone coming to the palace to see what a brave man their king was, how he risked his life hunting lions and what a great sportsman he was, B.S., pardon my <laughs> limited uh, use of four-letter words. Uh, it, the opposite is true. Why do we say that? Because what happened to these lions is first they were captured in the wild by his soldiers uh, and often using poison arrows to subdue the animals. Then the animals were starved and denied water for days sometimes a week. So that leaves them obviously in a very weakened state. And if that's not enough to tip the scales in favor of the great brave king, where in other words, there was no real risk of him being harmed, they severed the tendons on the hind legs of these animals. And yet even more tipping the balance uh, unfairly against the animals in this so-called hunt. It's just, it's not a hunt, it's, it's just animal abuse. These soldiers had poison tipped swords, which if the animals got too close, the lions too close to the chariot of the king, they would of course neutralize the animal with their swords from behind because of course they would, that was their job. So there was an, almost no risk, little to no risk for the so-called great brave hunter, the king. It was, it was a rigged game as they say, <laughs> and totally unfair contest if you could even call it a contest. I mean, I just call this animal abuse and it was common in the ancient world, but the uh -huh. Assyrians did it even more than other cultures that stacked it. But sometimes you'd see the lions would be, you know, starved and denied water and then let go, but not with maybe everything else done to them with their hind tendons severed and the poison, you know, swords and arrows that were available to, it just, it's uh, rather despicable in my, my mind. But anyway, maybe the, it was like a, go ahead. Sorry, it, maybe it was like a normal behavior because it was. It was, yeah. It was considered like a human, it's above. Yes, all the, yes, you're right. No, 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 that's a very good point. And, and so they didn't think anything was wrong with it. But even so, somewhere, somebody, either the artist or even maybe the king or someone in his circle of advisors must have thought, 
Well, we don't want to let people know too much of what we did to stack the deck against the animals because that would make them, the, the, the emperors seem less brave. So even in the ancient world, they were self-conscious about that or aware of that. That is not a fair contest. And they don't they hint at any of the things I did. Well, we don't have to guess. There's documents and evidence, written evidence to prove that's how they made these a one-sided contest, if you can even call them that. Yes, but you're right. They, they didn't think of it as being particularly wrong because, yeah, humans are, of course, meant by the gods. Back then was more than one god, right? Their gods told them they had the right to do it if they wanted either to uh, animals or to other humans that they conquered, of course, and they weren't considered immoral to, by doing that. Uh, but there were some artists you're going to see in the next slide that didn't maybe exactly agree with that attitude. But this one probably just did what he was told to it was maybe a group of people, but we know it's a bas-relief. So all the line is carved, of course, which is really good, isn't it? The similar texture is superb on the lion's hair, on the emperor's beard and, and uh, you know, uh, clothing and the chariot and these horses. Very well done, all done with carved line. Uh, but for space or depth, it's laughably bad. Look at this. Is this one horse with three heads and three legs <laughs> or six legs? It's supposed to be three horses side by side receding into space. They didn't know how to use diminishing size or foreshortening. Clearly, neither one was used in this. So all that's used is overlapping, and it's not well done there. So that, in that regard, this 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 work of art was not very highly skilled. This artist, but but the, it was when it came to I already mentioned the similar texture on the especially on the animals. And then also you'd have to say it is, uh, I used to say it was mostly stable. If you look carefully, the soldiers in the back are standing upright, the emperor is standing upright. Uh, and uh, this, this lion here is at a right angle to the ground, basically dead, almost dead. But, but then you have the charging lion and the horses, of course, the shields and the wheel of the chair. So it's a mixture of stable and dynamic details. Uh, again, the over, I already said the only technique here is overlapping for space. The largest mass was probably the horses. They basically become one mass by the poor way of depicting them here. If you count them as a single mass, they'd be the largest. Then it's a hard call between probably the charging lion looks slightly larger than the, the, the dead or nearly dead one. And then the emperor, I guess. Well, maybe it's the soldiers and the emperor's fifth. So you decide. That, that's why I give you flexibility on this. Okay, it's all warm. Of course, these are the real colors. I've seen this, this is the British Museum. Sandstone, made of real earth colors, okay? And the modeling is the shadows created from the lighting of the museum. Uh, oh, balanced? Yes, I, I would say so. This area here of animals and, and humans and him right in the middle across, you know, here. But top to bottom, it's not balanced. It's unbalanced toward the bottom. But left to right, I'd say it's roughly balanced. But some people might think the horses are just enough bigger than the combination of soldiers and the lion that it might feel more slightly unbalanced toward the right. I, I wouldn't argue with that. Okay, this next one is, is really powerful. Dying lioness, just like it sounds, two words. Dying lioness, Iraq, 650 BC or BCE. Now we're back to the Babylonians. They had overthrown the Assyrians, and this is their second golden age. So this in the very last slide are from the latter Babylonian Empire, when they ruled an even more powerful empire and more territory. They conquered everything between Turkey and Egypt. But I don't think they actually conquered the Egyptians. Well, I think briefly they did conquer the Egyptians, but just say most of what the Middle East was under their second empire uh, rule. So there's another hunting panel, right? And yet something's different about this one. I think some of you already noticed. This animal is depicted in great agony at close up range or in great detail, the agony you can say, or suffering of this animal is depicted very powerfully. It's roaring the death agony. I mean, there's no other word for that. When an animal, right, knows it's gonna die, if it's a large, powerful animal, it will, you know, not just <laughs> big cats, they really do, but, but even other kinds of animals like elephants will, will roar. And that's called the death agony. So it's roaring its last, you know, moment on life. Uh, it's called the death agony. 
And then here we have these arrows, which were probably poisoned. And we see, see, look what happened. The, 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 the tendons of the hind legs had been severed. So it, it's dragging. It's so it had no chance against whatever king of that period of Babylon history was hunting it. it. It had no chance. Look at this arrow went all the way through the body into the out in the bottom of the stomach even. And you see the blood gushing, right? When you get up a little bit closer here. This is in the British Museum and people, the whole tours of, of school kids come by here. I, I spent months in London, different times of my life. Uh, and and uh, when I go to the British Museum, because there's so much to see there, you, it takes you know, days just to see one section. Uh, every time there would be a group of kids from different ages and different schools throughout the British Isles, right? And this was always one of the most uh, powerful or emotional, moving, whatever word you want to use, of all the images in that section, in the Middle Eastern section, ancient Near Eastern, because uh, there's all these other hunting rituals. But there's something different. Can anybody guess what's different about this besides us seeing up close the animal suffering? Well, let me rephrase the question because we're running short on time. Uh, anybody want to, there's no right or wrong here, say what you think the artist maybe intended why i'll rephrase it again why would the artist show the suffering of this animal in such great detail could there be some other message besides how brave and powerful the king is the hunter could there be a different or not like go ahead suffering <laughs> yes well you said it part yeah basically to what maybe the artist was trying to do is make us what feel Empathy. Yeah, ex ex perfect. Empathy, I think so. Most historians who look at this, and if you ever see it live, if you ever get to the British Museum, if you ever go to London, you should. It's one of the world's great museums. Uh, I think you'll feel the, the, the animal suffering. And the artist, it's just too much of a coincidence that the artist would have shown this much uh, pain and suffering and mistreatment, frankly, of an animal without having some empathy. And therefore, why would he not want us to feel that empathy? I wouldn't want to lay odds on how long the career of this sculptor lasted after this panel, but you know what? Most of the egotistical rulers in the ancient world wouldn't have understood that. They'd be too, you know, ego or, you know, blinded by their own ego, I mean, and their own power to even think like that. So they probably, this guy got away with it, let's hope. But this is one of the first images in the history of ancient art to show, consciously depict the suffering of an animal and therefore probably, to elicit empathy, right? To make us, the viewer, feel empathy. Okay, that's the whole meaning. Balanced, yeah, oh yeah, clearly. If you draw a line here, you draw a line, however you do it, it you can come up with you know, equal masses of the body. And it's only two masses, the lioness, right? Her body and the arrows. Then we have the similar texture. It's, of course, it's excellent on the face, the hair, the ear, the blood even, the paws. That's all done with carved line, of course. Uh, and then we have, it's, it's dynamic. There's not a straight line in it. It, it is only overlapping is the only technique for space here of the uh, right lion's two legs overlap each other. The stomach overlaps one of the legs, which is partly missing here. This, and then the arrows and the blood overlap part of the body, of course. Uh, and then it, uh, let's see, um, balance. Oh, the rhythm is obvious with the legs the 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 paws the arrows even the blood creates rhythm uh and it's uh got modeling uh, of course it's a shadow from the sunlight uh, in the museum itself and let's see am i missing anything yeah a single mass weight oh the only technique for space oh i already said this and it's about let's see rhythm yeah i think i covered it and it's all dynamic uh, the modeling is Amazing. Nice. oh this is life size well, not quite. Pretty close. I don't know how big the original, you know, lioness would be smaller than a lion, a male lion. I think it was about life size. Yeah, it's a pretty big panel. It's more than half life size. We'll just say it that way. It's big enough that it's, at, well, the museum displays it at eye level. So when you see it, you're looking straight at this animal. Okay, let's do the last must know. We have to go all the way back. We're doing it very quickly because it won't take long. The last one is very uh, straightforward image, which is, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, Ishtar Gate, two words. It's on your syllabus, Ishtar, I-S-T-H-A-R. Sorry, you're getting a preview of what we're going to see the next few weeks. For some reason, the slide librarian put these slides together and uh, out of order. But that's all right, because it's all here, Ishtar Gate. 
There it is. That's our last must know. These are my own slides inside. This was in the Berlin Museum in Berlin, Germany. So our last must know is Ishtar, I-S-H-T-A-R, gate from Babylon. And this is B-A-B-Y-L-O-N. I think we haven't, I haven't spelled that word for you, which was the largest city in the ancient world at that time, the Western world, because there were probably bigger cities in China at that time. So it was the largest city in the uh, ancient Western world, Babylon. And it was the capital of the Babylonian Second Empire. Iraq, though, today would be the location, again, as all these are, the current location of the country of Iraq. And then 575 BC was the day. So this was a re or is, I should say, this is a, a recreation or a restoration. Well, then you get into a gray area. Part of it is authentic and part of it is completely new. Uh, you know, so is it a restoration? Well, the parts that are original, the only way to write it is that the parts that look like they might be, and they are a different color and texture than the walls, all these animals, right? These bas relief uh, panels of their sacred animals, which include goats, cows, and horses, three of their sacred animals. Uh, those are original. They were found buried in the rubble in what now is Iraq, where the city of Babylon once was, by German archaeologists who, again, didn't ask permission. <laughs> in the early 1900s, nobody did, really, or very, very few people. Lord Carter, when he discovered King Tut's tomb, totally different. That guy's a hero, and I'll tell you why. The Egyptians admire him now. He was a British noble. He could do whatever he wanted. Egypt was, it was a colony of uh, England in the 1920s. We'll get to that next week. He was the exception. <laughs> he respected the local culture, but the others didn't. The other European explorers, or well, they weren't explorers. Archaeologists, kind of an explorer. So this was found by German archaeologists in what's now Iraq, and the pieces of it were taken and then reassembled along with the new sections, which are pretty obvious. The new parts are the smooth looking, nearly new uh, brick, and it's all brick, brick and plaster, plaster for the animals. And some of that's done with brick, right? So what are we looking at here? We are looking at the main gate, this is the last part of the meaning, to the world's, sorry, the ancient world's largest city. When we say ancient world, we imply the Western world, right? We're implying everything from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic and from North Africa to Scandinavia, right? If it's not obvious. Uh, we're not talking about China or, 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 or Latin, uh, Latin America. That's different. So this is uh, the oldest, it was uh, not the oldest, sorry, I meant the largest city and the capital of the most powerful empire at that time in the ancient world. Oh, Rome became much bigger later, but that's centuries later. And this was the main gate. You had to pass through this gate to get into the city of Babylon. No one ever conquered the city because it was so strongly defended until, I think some of you know this, Alexander the Great, the Greek conqueror with his army, he did take the city of Babylon and had a local governor rule it for him. But until he came along for hundreds of years, uh, this city was never uh, successfully assaulted. So that's most of the meaning, except this skylight is kind of neat. I like that you have to write this. Uh, but that tells you some idea. We'll do the formal analysis and wrap it up here. We're in pretty close, about 922 to when I originally attended. But I did want to mention that uh, this particular um, a uh, piece of architecture was used in a uh, Alfred Hitchcock movie <laughs> in the uh. 1960s. Yes, in the 1960s, that museum that it's in, which is now Berlin, but it was East Berlin back in the 1960s. Remember, there was something called the Berlin Wall, the Cold War. Mm -hmm. We may go back to that, the way Putin's behaving, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's not looking. What good. movie? Uh, I'll tell you the name of the movie, uh, Torn Curtain. And it was talking about, and Paul Newman played a, uh, based on a true story, played a, uh, an American physicist, you know, scientist, who was trying to uh, get a uh, East German scientist out to the West to help us get ahead in the Cold War against the communists. And he had to kind of, you know, pretend to be a communist himself to get permission. And in one scene, there's a chase where the uh, one of the uh, spies for the East Germans figures out that Paul Newman is, 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 you know, fake and that he's actually an American agent. And he chases him through this museum. It's an interesting part of the movie. Now, I went there after the, this is my own slide, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, it was still standing when I was there in 1990, but parts of it 
it had basically been breached and people were walking across freely between East and West Germany. So this is a more recent thing, but that movie Torn Curtain, it's, it's where it, there's a lot of things about that movie that are really unique, even for Hitchcock. So it was filmed in, in East Germany and I don't know how they got permission because it's not very flattering to the dictatorship of East Germany, which killed thousands of their own people, thousands every few years practically they'd have a purge because people weren't supposed to criticize of course let alone try to get out and that's why they built the berlin wall obviously so this is a, a little icon you could say or, or an important object in a scene from a hitchcock movie but it, that's not necessarily an important part of the meaning but you could mention it if it's on the exam let's wrap it up balanced yes completely the two towers are the same height and width the largest masses are the two towers and then the archway and and of course the gate itself is gone and then the battlements right that's called battlements you know castles and palaces are always in the ancient world and middle ages too had those where archers would stand right so really you could just keep it simple and say the the, the three main masses visible in the picture are the two towers they're the first largest and then the arch well, I guess you'd say the battlements are the third largest. Here we have similar texture on the animals, the horses, the goats, uh, right? And uh, the, there's no cows here. When I say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it. There's a jackals. That's a jackal, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. Right. So just say the animals have similar texture, which is done with um, painted and carved line, because those are bas relief sculpture, each panel. And they are warm, they're warm colors, but the walls, of course, being blue are a cool color. As, and then the arch is a mixture of warm, right, tiles. That's all done with tiles. So there's cement texture on the animals, on their skin and hair, but on the walls, it's a real smooth texture of tile over brick. Uh, of course, tiles by themselves wouldn't stand up like this. So the tile is covering over a brick. Uh, this, these, uh, for space, were two towers that were 60 uh, feet tall each with about a 50 foot high archway in the middle. That's it, that's the real space, two 60 foot tall towers. 50 foot tall opening there in the middle. Uh, and it is dynamic on the arch. And I would say the animals are pretty stable. Look how they're standing and the walls and the towers are tall. So it's mostly stable, isn't it? The modeling is just the shadows from the museum lighting. Uh, and the line here is both carved on the animals and painted and then just painted line on the tile work here. That's all painted line on the decorative panels. Uh, let's see, the largest mass for space is real. Oh, balanced. Yeah, I already said it's balanced. And the rhythm is the repeated shapes of the, the two towers, the battlements, and the animals. Okay, uh, we came pretty close to ending when I originally intended. Um, I think I covered everything on this, right? Yeah. All right, any questions about uh, anything we covered uh, tonight? And of course, if you joined us late, you know that that all the first part of it was recorded and that will be uh, posted on uh, YouTube. And everybody knows, right? I've sent a couple of emails that my channel's called uh, uh, Mark Wilson's SRJC Art History Lectures. And then you just look up the class year and then the week of that lecture and you can watch it. Uh, so if you missed part of the uh, nine elements, that's a pretty important thing to, to, to watch before you start writing your paper. You, you probably would want to go back and watch that on after 8 p.m. on Friday uh, on YouTube and uh, take notes. Okay, any questions at all now before we sign um, off? Go ahead. I think that you already mentioned it, but for the extra credit is the museum Yes, any museum you can go to in person and show me proof you attended with this ticket stub, you know, a, a screenshot or, uh, you know, some kind of a link to, you know, oh. show me that you paid for the admission to a museum of art. We're talking about art museum now. Has to be. Um, there is also um, the photos from, for architectures, right? For yes, um, that's when you go take photos, exactly. Uh, four photos of any one building since it's a pandemic still, even though it's winding down, let's hope. Mm -hmm. Knock on wood. I'm not expecting you to go inside, but if it's a building where you can go inside and you feel comfortable, then you can show maybe three images of the inside, one of the out or two each. You need four different views of the same building, whether it's interiors and exteriors in color in a PDF and name the building, you know, the title, the, the, the name of the building, the location and your name in class. And that's worth 10 points. You can do that on any, any of these options you can do twice. So you get up to 20 points. Okay. 
category. Okay, yeah. I hope some of you do the architecture option because there's so many interesting, even um, right in Santa Rosa, there's all those Victorian houses, you know. Again, yeah, it, it has to uh, be like Victorian or because you know, like in the downtown Santa Rosa, it's like I don't know, it's Art Deco or what, like the Roxy. Yeah, what, say theater. that again. Where the, uh, there's plenty of Art Deco at yeah. Santa Rosa. Yeah. The, the Roxy Theater and the oh building. yes, 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 novel? yes, yes, sure. There's a lot <laughs> of Art Deco movie theaters in the Bay Area. San Rafael, the old down. I'm just writing about okay. it for Marin Magazine. The Raphael so Theater. Is that sounds one. right. That, that's a bit of a drive for you, but you know, yes. Okay. And then I think in uh, Petaluma, there's some uh, Art Deco architecture in downtown Petaluma. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to describe the style of it because that's more detailed than you need. Just the name of the building, the location, and your name in class. Yeah, sure. That's a good example. Or movie theaters, or a pa you know any kind of a you know a, a synagogue, a mosque, a church, uh, a historic home. The only thing I'd say you shouldn't do is you know a Costco warehouse outlet, uh -huh. you know, a big box store. Nah, that's not interesting enough to be considered art because they're mass produced. But anything that's not mass produced, historic or modern, uh, qualifies as an architectural site for that purpose. Yes, it's worth ten points. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anybody else? Oh, um, I have another question. Um, sure. I already sent the article that I found. Uh, for uh, you say that if we found that there were another, like I'm a rabbi. Yeah, the Steely. You mean? Uh huh. Sure. So. Oh yeah, uh, but I'll see it tomorrow. Okay. And then I'll say, I always confirm when I get extra credit for all my classes, I'll say, I got your extra credit and I gave you X, whatever, five points, 10, 10 points. If it's an article, it's five. Okay, points. Cool. thank you. You'll get that by email confirmation. Okay, anybody else? All right. Last yeah, question. Mark, um, yeah. Professor Wilson, I uh, sent you, jeez. Uh, I sent you a message uh, during the break if you could send me the syllabus and the initial files from the first class. Um, Did you send it by email to my uh, Mark W? If you do that, I'll get it to you much faster. It's a little too late to do it now because that, where are my, my files, like the syllabus and all, are in a different computer, not in my house. Okay. So if you send it to Mark W, did you? If not, then just resend it and I'll send it to you tomorrow. It'll be in the okay. afternoon, probably early afternoon. All right. Thank you. So. I right know, send whatever you need. You just make sure you, you list it. All right, sure. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions? All right, well, we'll see you guys uh, a week from today. And by next week, you should start be thinking, of, uh, if not, have already chosen a topic for your papers. Okay, and I'll check my email if you have questions in the meantime. All right. Thank you, everybody. You You're welcome. Thanks. Good class. All right, take care. See you one week from tonight.